If you play video games, chances are you're familiar with PlayStation. Now entering its fifth generation, the PlayStation brand has become one of the most recognizable in all of gaming. But its success was anything but a foregone conclusion. Launched in late 1994 at its home territory of Japan, the Sony PlayStation started life as yet another player in the crowded home console market before rocketing to worldwide success by the turn of the century. It's easy to take its success for granted, but if you didn't live through the rise of PlayStation, you may not fully appreciate its accomplishments. Which is why today, on this episode of DF Retro, we're rewinding back to the launch of the original PlayStation. We'll discuss Sony's history in the gaming industry, the state of console gaming in the mid-90s, the PlayStation's launch across Japan, North America, and Europe, all while comparing and contrasting every single launch title. So join us as we look back at the PlayStation during its early days and relive this historic time in gaming together. By the 1980s, the Sony Corporation had established itself as a major player in the home electronics market. From televisions to hi-fi to portable music players and beyond, Sony's products were recognizable and respected the world over. At the same time, Sony was beginning to look beyond at just building the machines that would play your media, they wanted to publish it as well. Sony already had an established foothold in the music industry, but there were other avenues to explore going forward. I'm talking about video games, of course. After all, by the mid 80s, Nintendo and its partners had already found a lot of success with the family computer console. Anecdotes from this time suggest that Sony execs weren't really all in on video games, but there was money to be made and publishing arrangements got underway. Starting in 1986, Sony would begin publishing games on platforms including the MSX computers and Nintendo's Famicom. Sekima 2, Akuma no Gyakusho, is one such example, one of their earlier games. It's a Famicom game released in 1986 focused around a band of the same name. Sony also published titles such as Golf Force by HAL, along with multiple sports titles on the MSX, just to name a few. But in the West, Sony became more well known for the ImageSoft brand, a California-based subsidiary that spun off from the CBS Sony group. Starting with Super Dodgeball from Technos Japan, Sony ImageSoft would release a wide range of games, often based on film properties. Some were good, others perhaps less so, but it's important to understand that in the West, this was the main perception of Sony as a games publisher at the time. When you thought about Sony and games, you thought of this logo right here. Before all this, however, an engineer at Sony Japan named Ken Kuduragi had quietly built up a partnership with Nintendo to develop an audio coprocessor for use in Nintendo's then next generation Super Famicom, also known as the Super NES. The development of the SPC700 chip, as it was known, was seemingly unpopular with Sony management of the time, but President Norio Oga allowed Kuduragi to complete his work. It was thanks to Sony then that Nintendo's 16-bit console sounded the way it did. Ultimately, this initial partnership led to the now infamous Super NES CD-ROM debacle. You know how this goes, CD-ROM was fast becoming a very popular medium at the time. NEC was first to market with its PC engine CD-ROM-ROM system, Sega was of course working on the Mega CD slash Sega CD, and naturally, Nintendo wanted to ensure that it would be ready with a new product as well. And this is where Sony's engineering experience came into play. They were one of the two main creators of the compact disc format after all. Thus, Kuduragi and team worked to create the Super Disc format, which would become an add-on or standalone unit designed to play CD-ROM-based Super NES games. One of these Nintendo PlayStation, as it was called, prototypes even surfaced back in 2015. 
Really, this whole situation comes down to what happened back at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1991. Nintendo went on stage during one of its press conferences and announced a partnership to create a new CD-ROM based format with Philips rather than Sony. Yet the day prior, Sony had announced its own partnership with Nintendo to create the new Super Disk based consoles. The story here is that Nintendo wasn't entirely satisfied with the proposed royalty scheme around the Super Disk, and Yamauchi and crew basically ran to the other major player in the compact disc space, Philips, in an attempt to stick it to Sony, so to speak. It didn't really work. Philips did get a chance to work with Nintendo, of course, but we all know how that goes. Yes, the CDI would be the home for many of our favorite games, including Cold Felt Mario, Zelda 1 Gamelon, Zelda's Adventure, Thunder Paradise, and my favorite single player experience, the Joy of Sex. But as for Sony, well, this might have been the end of their little excursion into the world of console gaming, but instead, with Oga's permission, Kudaragi started work on a standalone system instead. Known as the PlayStation X during development, Kudaragi and team set out to build a new box aiming to deliver next generation 3D graphics while leveraging the power of the Sony Corporation to ensure that it would become a success. But here's the thing, the console space back in the early 90s was absolutely congested with competition. Just think about it for a second, we already had established consoles with the Super NES, the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive, and the PC Engine in Japan, but during the development of PlayStation, we saw the release of consoles such as the Atari Jaguar, the 3DO, add-ons for Sega's 16-bit machine, and even multimedia boxes such as the CDI or the consoleized Amigas and FM Town systems. Most of these consoles saw little success, and in the case of 3DO, another Japanese electronics giant, Panasonic, was even associated with the manufacturing of it. Beyond that, it was widely known at this point that Nintendo, Sega, and NEC, with its very successful PC Engine line, all had next generation consoles in development. So what the heck would Sony even know about video games? The important point here is that Sony quickly identified key areas where they needed to succeed, they needed a powerful machine with compelling software and strong marketing. They also needed strong partnerships with developers and to deliver a friendly development environment to ensure an ease of development for those developers. The big thing though is that the PlayStation would represent a major shift in game development with a push towards 3D. Now Sega and Namco and others had already made 3D polygon graphics popular in the arcade with titles such as Sega's Virtua Fighter. This cutting edge arcade hardware gave us an idea of where the industry was going, and this is precisely what Sony wanted to bring home, at least within reason. In the lead up to release then, Sony made some serious power moves. They acquired the UK based Cygnosis, which would contribute both software and, along with SN Systems, would help develop the PsyQ development kits for the PlayStation. They would also form strong partnerships with key Japanese developers such as Namco, Konami, Squaresoft, and Capcom. They knew that if they were to succeed, they needed the software to back it up. PlayStation would finally arrive in Japan on December 3rd, 1994, changing the landscape of gaming forever. The PlayStation arrived in Japan along with eight games at a suggested retail price of 39,800 yen. It found success out of the gate, though at the time the also recently launched Sega Saturn was performing slightly better, due in part I'd imagine to the conversion of the ultra popular Virtue Fighter being one of its launch games. There's little doubt however that this was the beginning of an exciting new era. Right from the start, it was clear that PlayStation was different.
With its slim gray chassis, the experience of Sony's industrial design team was plain to see. Its form evoked the consumer electronics Sony was known for in a way that most game consoles at the time really didn't. It was a sleek, beautiful design with a subtle color accent around its logo. The CD-ROM drive takes center stage with a large round opening along with three circular buttons complementing it. It's important to consider first impressions when talking about new console designs. It may seem pedestrian by today's standards, but the PlayStation was fresh and enticing in 1994. It's also one of the first consoles to rely entirely on swappable memory cards for save game storage, and each save stored on these cards received its own bespoke icon visible from within the memory card manager. A nice touch, and how about that color scheme? The PlayStation also shipped with a then fascinating new controller design with long handles extruding from each side, along with curious shapes representing the buttons. The basic layout is built upon what Nintendo had created with the Super NES, but adds an extra set of shoulder buttons to the mix along with the aforementioned handles. Although a single piece of plastic, the segmented design of the D-pad was less than optimal in this original controller. It's something that would improve in time, however. Inside, the PlayStation houses a MIPS R3000 compatible CPU clocked at just over 33 MHz. The GTE or Geometry Transformation Engine coprocessor contained within the CPU was used to accelerate 3D operations. It features 2 MB of EDO memory along with additional frame buffer and SPU RAM. The Toshiba designed graphics processor offers a wide range of features and output options that were extremely competitive for its day, not to mention a very powerful sound processing unit resembling a next generation take on the SPC 700. Naturally, the PlayStation also shipped with a 2x speed optical disk drive. While it has its limitations, many of which we'll see in this video, Kudaragi and team made a lot of smart decisions at the time, and the console offered solid 2D and 3D performance at a competitive price, and it was developer friendly. Which brings us to the reason you'd buy a console in the first place, the games. If you were purchasing a brand new PlayStation on day one in Japan, this is what you would have had in store. Welcome to Ridge City, home of the very first PlayStation game, SLPS 00001. This is the game that redefined expectations on what was possible with home console racing games. With its lush 3D graphics, smooth frame rate, and pounding soundtrack, Ridge Racer came remarkably close to capturing the arcade experience at home. This is also the beginning of what would become one of my favorite racing game series of all time, a series that would persist for nearly 20 years after this original game. But to fully appreciate what Namco delivered, you have to consider the state of 3D racing games on consoles circa 1994. If you were playing on a Super NES or Sega Genesis, 1994 introduced a pair of rather impressive polygonal racing games. Firstly, a port of Virtua Racing on the Mega Drive, which launched in early 94, alongside Stunt Race FX on Super NES, which was powered by the Super FX chip. Both were a far cry from the likes of Race Drive and from Atari, but while additional chips embedded into the cartridge allowed these games to make significant strides, they still ran at obscenely low frame rates with relatively simplistic visuals. But there were other more powerful machines in the market by this point. The Atari Jaguar asks players to do the math, but racing fans weren't exactly well served here. Its two 3D polygonal racing games, Checkered Flag and Club Drive, were seemingly both released just a week or so before the PlayStation launched in Japan. These are not good games, nor visually impressive, and the less said about the frame rate, the better. The 3DO, though, put up more of a fight with impressive titles such as Road and Track Presents the Need for Speed and Crash and Burn. But despite the impressive visuals, both these games ran at roughly 20 frames per second or worse. But then comes Ridge Racer on the PlayStation, which not only delivers a more visually striking presentation all around, but it manages to do it at a near perfect 30 frames per second. It may not seem like much today, but there really wasn't anything even remotely comparable at the time. 
Ridge Racer kicked the figurative doors off the competition. It's also an exceptionally well-made game to boot, with top-tier drift mechanics and excellent track design. Granted, there's not a lot of content here, it's pretty much just variations on a single track, but this was an arcade game at home. Or was it? Well, that's the thing. In my memory, Ridge Racer was pretty close to matching that arcade original, but in reality, when you put them side by side, it's really not quite there. The arcade game features higher resolution textures, increased geometric detail, and both a higher frame rate and resolution. The home version falls short, but considering the cost of the machine and the state of home racing games, it was still the most impressive thing in the market. It is worth noting that exactly four years after the release of the original Ridge Racer, Namco released Ridge Racer High Spec, a bonus disc included with Ridge Racer Type 4. While limited to a head-to-head -head race only, Ridge Racer High Spec showcased the evolution in Namco's abilities when working on the system. The game now runs in a higher resolution interlaced mode at 60 frames per second. Rendering quality on the cars and environments has also improved slightly. It's a perfect example of how console games can evolve post-launch. But there's more. It's easy to take for granted these days, but this new generation of consoles seriously improved the audio side of things. Obviously, there's the CD format itself. Ridge Racer uses Redbook audio for music playback, and due to the small size of the game, all the required data is loaded at startup, allowing you to remove and replace the disc with a different music CD of your choice. But the PlayStation's SPU also enables crystal clear digital sample playback, so sound effects and voice clips are of high quality as well. The soundscape was a huge part of its appeal, that's for sure. Now control-wise, Ridge Racer plays like a dream with the D-pad, but Namco offered an alternative solution soon after launch with the Nejikon driving controller. With four analog buttons and a twist-to-turn action, it feels remarkably satisfying, yet less clunky than a full-on racing wheel in your living room. Oh, and we can't forget to mention the loading sequence, right? When you first boot Ridge Racer, you're greeted by Galaxian. Well, at least a minigame version. Namco actually patented the concept of using minigames to mask loading, and that patent only expired as of 2015. But it is something that they would use many times over going forward. Now, before we move on to our next game, we should briefly talk about one of the visible flaws that you may have noticed when playing Ridge Racer, visible texture warping. This applies to basically all 3D games on the PlayStation, and it comes down to the way the system draws and sorts its polygons. PlayStation lacks a Z buffer, which would be used to determine depth information, and as a result, when textures are applied to the polygons, at least as they're drawn on the PlayStation, they're interpreted linearly in screen space, resulting in visible distortion. This is compounded by the lack of floating point operations. All calculations in 3D are done using integers, which reduces the precision in polygon rendering. Combined, this results in noticeable polygon jittering and texture warping that would come to define the PlayStation. In 1994, though, these sorts of hard decisions were necessary to get the price of the hardware down, and all different consoles released during this period exhibit their own unique flaws as well. Still, despite this, just seeing a real 3D cityscape moving at a smooth 30 frames per second was mind-blowing. The journey through Ridge City is a memorable one, and this was a great way to kickstart the PlayStation. But the next game is something a little different. The Konami PlayStation Legacy begins right here with SLPS 00002, Gokujo Parodius Da Deluxe Pack. If Ridge Racer was all about showcasing what was possible in 3D, Parodius demonstrates what can be done with classical pixel art. This disc includes the first two arcade titles in the Parodius series, Parodius Da Shinwa Kara Owarae and Gokujo Parodius Kako no Eiko o Matomete. At its core, Parodius is effectively a parody of Gradius, but also so much more. 
Pulling in wild imagery and music from so many directions, this is basically a celebration of all things Konami, circa 1994. It's also a brilliant set of shooters. With Gradius mechanics serving as the base, Parodius allows players to select from a wide range of characters or ship types, each with their own attack styles and power-ups. You'll play through a selection of colorful stages on your way to the end. It's excellent. It's also a nice demonstration of PlayStation's 2D prowess. Both arcade games are presented with their original artwork and sound completely intact, and that's key here. Until the arrival of Saturn and PlayStation, arcade games like this were always trimmed down to fit within the confines of consoles of this era. Note that I didn't say arcade perfect though. It is close, really close in fact, but there are some minor differences. For instance, the background color gradient in Gokujo Parodius appears to be somewhat smoother in the original arcade game compared to the PlayStation conversion, though the rest of the art is intact. Parodius Da also exhibits a slightly different output resolution. According to the PS1 Digital's menu, the PlayStation version switches to the system's 256 pixel wide output mode, the same as Super Famicom in fact. The arcade game, however, runs at 288 by 224 As a result, there is a 32 pixel reduction in screen real estate, something you can see here. Note how in this position, more of the stage is visible in the arcade game. The thing is, Gokujo Parodius also shares the same 288 by 224 resolution in the arcade, but in this case, Konami opted to present the game using a 320 pixel wide mode instead on PlayStation, resulting in additional black bars on the left and right of the image while preserving all pixel data, so you don't lose anything with this one. Still, aside from minor quirks like this, these games were very close to matching the arcade version, which was a big deal. So how does it stack up against prior console versions? Well, Parodius Da, the 1990 game, had the most ports, and here's just a few of them. The premier port of this era is certainly the Super Famicom version. It's excellent and offers an experience that is surprisingly close to the arcade game, but if you look closely, you'll see that much of the art has been altered slightly. While PlayStation and Super Famicom both share the same 256 pixel output, the modified art on Super Famicom attempts to match the arcade version's playfield size, while PlayStation, which uses the actual arcade artwork, simply stretches the aspect ratio slightly. This becomes super evident when the first boss appears. He's slightly off screen on PlayStation, when in reality, he should fit within the play space in both arcade and Super Famicom versions. The next stage also shows a significant difference in terms of background complexity. There's simply a lot more going on in the PlayStation version. Again, just like the arcade original. Now, there were other ports during this era as well. The PC Engine version is pretty good, but not quite on par with the Super NES version. With its reduced parallax background scrolling, simplified color scheme, and lower detail in its tile set, it doesn't quite stack up, but still, it's pretty good for the platform. Even Game Boy received a port of Parodius Da, and honestly, it's surprisingly excellent. And Audi would never forgive me if I didn't mention the Famicom version of the game as well, which, given the hardware, is a pretty darn impressive port. Gokujo Parodius also received a Super Famicom conversion, which was released just before the launch of PlayStation. It's impressive, but again, it's missing some of the detail available in the PlayStation conversion, which in turn is just pulled straight from the arcade game. Also, some of the effects, such as the fading in of background elements here, they're missing on Super Famicom as well. The point here is that the PlayStation brought the arcade versions of these games to home consoles for the first time. In May of the following year, however, Konami also released the same deluxe pack on the Sega Saturn, which brings us to our very first Saturn vs. PlayStation battle. And this game kinda hints at Saturn's superior performance in 2D games. Firstly, Parodius Da. It's nearly the same between the two, with only one difference. Saturn does not support a 256 pixel wide output mode, so in this case, the Saturn version now displays more of the stage than the arcade original, filling the full 320 pixel wide frame. So in this case, the Saturn version is even superior to the arcade original. Other than that though, they're basically identical. With Gokujo Parodius, Saturn has multiple advantages here. Firstly, once again, we have expanded screen real estate. This time though, both use a 320 wide output mode. The difference here is that the Saturn draws more of the stage than the arcade or PS1 version. So yeah, once again, better than arcade. 
It is worth noting that in the Saturn version, you can toggle between full or arcade mode. So if you want to reduce your viewport, you have the option to do so. This option is not available on the PlayStation. Some of the effects that are missing on PlayStation have also been restored on the Saturn, such as the wavy line effect in the background layer here. But there's more. On PlayStation, specifically with Gokujo Parodius, you'll encounter minor slowdown and screen tearing in specific stages, with a reduction in gameplay speed when this occurs. The Saturn version in comparison is virtually flawless. Now if I slow the game down to 50% speed, take a close look at the top of the screen in the PlayStation version here. See what I mean? There's screen tearing. If we do the same on Sega Saturn though, it looks just fine in comparison. Now to be fair, it's worth keeping in mind that the PlayStation version is a launch title that means it likely faced a tighter deadline. We know that later deluxe pack releases on PlayStation were also improved over this one, so things definitely got better, but it is interesting to see how the Saturn and PlayStation versions stack up in the context of this launch period. Even with these minor flaws on the PlayStation though, Parodius is still an excellent addition to the lineup, and in retrospect, one of the very best games to launch with the PlayStation. It's still just as amazing today as it was back in 1994, and is definitely worth playing today. You know what's not worth playing though? This is Tama, Adventurous Ball in Giddy Labyrinth, SLPS 0003. On the surface, there really isn't a lot to say about this one, but then you realize Tama is the only 3D multi-platform game that launched alongside both Saturn and PlayStation. Can you imagine releasing a game at launch on both of these systems? Time Warner Interactive, the studio previously known as Tengen, sure can, and that's exactly what they did. Tama is effectively a physics-driven maze game that has players rolling the titular ball around the playing field in search of the goal. While the idea of such a game being released for a console at full price may seem absurd today, I can kind of see the logic behind it. Tama kind of occupies a space similar to, say, multimedia reference CDs of the 90s. It's basically a 3D toy that you can mess with. It's not especially fast-paced or exciting, but I mean, look at it, it was fully 3D on your TV, and you could control it. That's pretty much the selling point here, I'd imagine. Visually, it's not exactly Ridge Racer, but it's not that bad. Most of the objects are flat shaded, with only the table itself leaning on textures. In that sense, it still manages to look reasonably clean. It's also backed by a rather sleepy but pleasant soundtrack on top of that. What surprises me about Tama, though, is that there are actual differences between Saturn and PlayStation. Being that it's an early 3D game, I really didn't expect a lot from the Saturn version, knowing how difficult it is to develop for, but as it turns out, it's kind of the better version. What do I mean? Well, firstly, take a look at the background layer behind the playfield. Notice how on PlayStation, it's a completely static, poorly scaled image. On Saturn, however, the developers seem to use VDP2 to draw this background, allowing for scaling and tilting, which means as you move the table around in 3D, the background moves too, lending it an increased sense of depth. Beyond this, the space below the table displays a shadow on the Saturn, but not on PlayStation. The most unexpected twist though is this. Look closely at the table in the shadowed area on Saturn. You can actually see the background layer through it. It would seem that there's some kind of subtle transparency effect here that isn't even implemented on the PlayStation. Imagine that, the first multi-platform game between the two has transparency on Saturn but not PlayStation? That's the complete opposite of what you'd expect. Now of course, this is only really feasible I'd imagine due to the reliance on VDP2 as the background layer. The system can seemingly blend these together. Really though, despite these curious differences, the game really isn't impressive on either platform. The concept itself isn't necessarily bad, but the sluggish ball physics make for a rather tedious gameplay experience. This is just one game that doesn't really hold up. The next one though, well, see for yourself.
Crime Crackers comes courtesy of Media Vision, a company that would be instrumental in laying a lot of the groundwork of what consumers' visual identity of the PlayStation would be and their eventual output in the West later on. Though here in their first efforts on the platform, they burst onto the scene with a pretty surprising hybrid. Part first-person shooter, part dungeon-crawling RPG, Crime Crackers sees you take part in an intergalactic scuffle as the Pink Dolphin a team of crackers seeking bounties and rewards in the wake of a war that ended long ago. The team consists of three members, Emilia, Duran, and Lisa, all of their unique abilities and backstory of how they ended up where they are. It's all quite fascinating. Crime Crackers is a rare Japanese-developed attempt of what can loosely be seen as a fast-paced first-person shooter, though with a quite unique and surprisingly simple control scheme. Each stage takes the team to a maze of corridors, and enemies of varying degrees of size and dexterity are there to stop the team from progressing. Push the square button then, and you bring up the crosshair, activating the battle mode. In this mode, the D-pad moves across here, while the shoulder buttons are used to strafe around the playfield in full 3D to avoid all the attacks. For more close-range combat, pushing the L2 and R2 button lets you defend yourself against oncoming fire and set up some helpful counterattacks. Between the three characters that can be changed with the select button, your offensive strategy will vary greatly based on this. Amelia is a straight shooter with rapid fire, Duran is a powerhouse with a slower but much stronger line of fire, while Lisa is a close combat swordswoman who is primed for melee combat. Making use of these differences is key to overcoming the enemy offensive as the game gets progressively more challenging and introduces new enemies across the stages that you gotta take out in different ways. Each character can also make use of the unique power bomb attack, which usually will clear the screen. At the end of each stage, then, a boss battle awaits with some one on three action. In between stages, a shop system can be accessed, and here the characters can be upgraded by buying and selling your old equipment and increasing their stats on their weapons and on their armor. This system is more akin to the dungeon crawler genre and lends some nice variety to the overall game as your weapons and projectiles will change as you upgrade. During the game, these upgrades can be accessed from the menu screen and items can also be used for temporary boosts of power, health refills, and even plot device items that need to be used in specific places can be found here. Despite the differences in combat, Crime Cracker still shares a lot with its western counterparts in the FPS genre and isn't a complete departure, however. The stages will still focus on exploration, keys and colored cards must be located in order to progress, and the action is pretty fast-paced much like Doom, for example. Where Crime Crackers does deviate, however, is the sheer focus on story throughout the game. Whereas the Space Marine or the Soldier of War seen in its western counterparts runs through the stages having the bloodletting and visceral slaughter play out the internal drama, Crime Crackers makes extensive use of dialogue and story throughout the engaged player. Between stages, long cutscenes will play out to set the stage of events, and even the stages themselves, the characters will communicate with one another, or who they meet up with in the stage like the bosses. Some stages exist solely as a story moving vehicles even. Graphically, Crime Crackers might just be one of the strongest of all the launch game. Running in PlayStation's high resolution 512 by 240 mode, the fully 3D stages and enemy characters are rendered in a small window, with the three playable characters making up the HUD and screen frame. This slightly smaller window and obscuring perspective allows for some quite smooth gameplay and performance, with minimal texture warping and pretty sharp texture work overall on the locations and especially the enemy models. The sound, handled by Noriyuki Asakura of Tenchu fame, is quite effective as well, with some pretty cracking music that mixes rock, string instrumentation, and jazz. Just take a listen to this. So while it's interesting and surprisingly easy to play, Crime Crackers is not without its flaws. The maze design can be tedious to navigate, even with the unlockable maps that you get eventually, and the battle mode, which is an interesting idea to allow for both precision and combat and in navigation separately, it's often with the slight delay when you press it, and the sheer finger placement on the controller is gonna leave you open to surprise attacks most of the time. The game tries to mix up the monotony of all this with some different scenarios and goals that can be accomplished during a stage, but after a while, a corridor is a corridor, and there's only so much fun that can be had within that game. Perhaps most surprising, and I suspect this is an aspect that doesn't really concern most of the audience watching this, is the lack of voice acting. 
Yes, this game would have been a prime candidate to make use of the new Fangle CD format and actually include some voice acting, considering the lengthy cutscenes that play out throughout the entire game with dialogue and interplay between these characters. It would have been greatly aided by having some voice to drive home the humor and drama of all this. Archaic and a bit clumsy, Crime Cracker sports a ton of charm though, and it's certainly a welcome addition to the PlayStation launch in Japan, and it would even get a sequel down the line, though I think that's a story for another day. It's an interesting game, and actually a somewhat missed opportunity, as I think it would have found an audience on the PlayStation outside Japan for the other launch territories, especially considering what we did get in the FPS space at launch instead. <sighs> But enough about Crime Crackers, let's get cracking on to the next game. AV Evolution, or Aresha the Ikkoyon Evolution, or just A4 for short, is an entry into the transportation sim series that saw its beginnings on the home computer systems in Japan, such as the PC-98, and is probably more affectionately known as the A-Train series by its fans. It's a long-running series in Japan, and even got a western release back in the day as Railroad Empire, and is still around to this day. These games are quite strict simulation games, and this console version is no different, throwing you into a brutal management of the day-to-day -day task of connecting cities, people, and industries via the road systems. Evolution packs most of the content from the PC version of the game, albeit with a slight aesthetical update as well as the sound, though its greatest addition to the series has to be the window mode, generating a 3D view from either the cars or the trains the players can kick back and spectate on their constructions. This was such an impactful addition that it would go on to influence future entries in the series, and yeah, it's pretty neat, don't you think? Alright, so enough of the excitement. A4 Evolution is a good simulation game, though it goes without saying that it's a game for enthusiasts, so it's not for everyone. The game came in two variations at launch, the standard game and the launch Gente Bun, which came with extensive documentation, a mouse pad, and the PlayStation mouse, a peripheral we haven't really talked about so far, but is woefully underused for the system. The eventual upgrade to this version, A4 Evolution Global, would actually release in the US and Europe, along with the mouse and mouse pad. This may not be the most exciting release at the launch of the PlayStation, but it does highlight the system's ability to deliver PC-like experiences on a home console, and that's quite worth noting. And even today, A4 is still fondly remembered in Japan, helped by the fact that the theme song to the game, Machikado no Ona, is still quite popular with game music enthusiasts and does show up a lot on compilations and fan arrangements. So for myself, I think I'm gonna stick to Densha the Go for my PlayStation train needs. Neketsu Oyako is PlayStation's very first side-scrolling brawler, and you'd be forgiven if you thought this was created by Technos Japan creator of Double Dragon, since it looks a lot like something they might make, but no, this is instead the work of Thunder Force developer Technosoft. Alas, Neketsu Oyako is nowhere near the caliber of Technosoft's usual fare. This isn't a bad game, just very average. From what we can tell, it seems likely that this game started life on Nintendo's Super Famicom. It definitely has a similar look. So how does it play? Well, each of the three available characters has their own unique handling. And like a good brawler, the core mechanics feel pretty solid. Plus, you have a quarter circle attack and various other techniques at your disposal. Problem is, the stages themselves are generally boring and enemy types and patterns aren't as interesting as you might like for a game like this. There's precious little variety. Every stage is pretty much just a horizontal line. The best brawlers tend to mix things up in terms of stage design, but that's not the case here. Sure, the idea of fighting your way through the inside of a whale sounds like a good old time on paper, but in reality, it's kind of a slog. And there's a reason for that. Despite its relatively simplistic visuals, Neketsu Oyako exhibits a lot of slowdown on PlayStation. 
Numerous battles throughout the game run in slow motion, increasing the amount of time spent brawling and drawing out what should have been fast-paced battles. The persistence of this slowdown basically spoils the fun. Now, Parodius already demonstrated what the PlayStation could offer over 16-bit machines in 2D, but what about Neketsu Yako? Well, it does feature relatively large sprites with a decent number of animation frames, and it uses the PlayStation's alpha blending features to create various special effects. But at the same time, it looks like a game that could have worked on, say, the Super Famicom. Honestly though, if the game didn't slow down, it would be perfectly fine. Audio-wise, again, no boundaries are pushed here. The music isn't nearly as impressive as Technosoft's Mega Drive titles, but it's not bad. There are some good tracks in here. As with Parodius and Tama, however, Neketsu Oyako was also released on the Sega Saturn. It was not, however, a launch title for the Saturn. The Sega version came out in 1995, months after the PlayStation launch, and it shows. I was surprised to see such variation in visual quality between the two. Primarily, the color palette on Saturn has been altered throughout. It's subtle in certain stages, but more noticeable in others, and basically offers a punchier look on the Saturn, which in this case, I kind of prefer. Another difference lies in the handling of transparency. Light cones, special moves, and water, among other things, all rely on PlayStation's support for alpha blending, while on Saturn, due to how these objects work, they rely instead on dithered transparency. Given the art style though, I kind of feel as if the dithering works better in this case, but ultimately, it's a matter of preference. Inside the whale, the differences are more profound. On PlayStation, the background layer slowly warps and pulsates to give the impression of a living creature. On Saturn, this effect is not used, and instead the developers have implemented some sort of line-scrolling technique to create the illusion of a circular tunnel representing the beast's uh, digestive tract, I suppose. Either way, it looks great. In several other areas, the PlayStation version features color cycling on distant water, while on Saturn, it's static in comparison, which is one advantage in favor of Sony's machine. If we skip to this roller coaster section though, note how the two center tracks were removed on Saturn, which I suppose makes more sense logically, but in its place we have additional cloud sprites scrolling by as you play through this section. Other changes include a strong full screen glow effect used while brawling in the lava stage on Saturn, while breakable walls have a visible top on Sega's machine and break apart slightly differently. This isn't even the full list of changes, but you get the idea. The real advantage in favor of Saturn though lies in its performance. Basically the game runs better on the Saturn. And it matters in this game, as when the frame rate drops, all frames are still drawn. It just takes longer, meaning that the game runs in slow motion. On PlayStation, many of the game's battles struggle to maintain 60 frames per second, leading to sluggish gameplay. It's not perfect on Saturn, but it's a lot closer to locking to 60 throughout these sequences. It's just a lot less frustrating to play on Saturn due to this increased speed. You can really see it here during this roller coaster battle, which highlights that, like Parodius, there is actually mild screen tearing on the PlayStation side as well as slowdown. So in terms of overall gameplay speed and visual quality, the Saturn version has the edge all around. So yeah, I'm a little surprised by this one. It's a perfectly serviceable game on the PlayStation, but the Saturn version, although mostly the same, just feels a lot more responsive and fast to play. I wasn't fully aware of these differences prior to making this comparison either. It's fascinating that the first three games which we've compared between Saturn and PlayStation are all slightly better on Sega's machine. In time though, things would change. Takes to be amazing at Mahjong, brother. Oh, Daddy Cool, you know it. Get the tables ready and break it up, because I'm gonna take you down. Step into the ring and face me then, little man, because this is where the big boys play. Oh, you won't even be able to withstand my sweet chin music 
as this game packs music so good, it will want to make Yo Yo Ma want to ma ma drong all night long, baby. You talk big, but can you withstand the action as I lift the brick towards the heavens as it gazes towards its impending impact under the basking sun and slam it right down through the table into the abyss? Oh, you can take that brick and you can shove it where the sun soft doesn't shine. Because Chow Pong Kong John, there is no way you can beat me at Mahjong. When the dust settles and the gong is rung, you will be surly missed as I stand the victor. Oh, it's a victor that you want. How about we race the stakes? How about we up the ante? How about we drop the cage? How about we go Mahjong? Goku Tenjiku from Electronic Arts Victor. Bring it, brother. Journey to the east, journey to the west. You'll always lose against the best. Let's go! And yes, well, uh, this is a Mahjong game as well. Yes, uh, yes, it certainly is. You say this is from Electronic Arts' Victor? Yes, but it was developed by Chat Noir, the same developer from the other Mahjong game. Oh, I see. And it was available for the Sega Saturn, among other platforms as well. Uh, is it any better? Well, uh, let's see. Hmm, no, it's, uh, it's exactly the same. I guess that's something, I suppose. They mastered multi-platform development at launch for both platforms. John, you won't believe this, but uh, they released an update for this game in 1999. Wait, what? Yep, Mahjong Goku Tenjiku 99. Is it any better? I mean, uh, it looks slightly better. Oh? That's about it. Brother. Okay, so maybe it is worth expanding upon these titles briefly before we move on. Firstly, it's important to note that Mahjong games in general were hugely popular in Japan during this period, both in arcades and on home consoles. In the case of Mahjong Goku Tenjiku, it wasn't just on Saturn and PlayStation. There were also 3DO, Super Famicom, and even NEC PCFX versions of the game produced. And it was another entry in Shanoar's already established series. This has to be one of the dumbest multi-platform comparisons in the history of this channel, though. Yeah. Mahjong Goku Tenjiku across all five platforms. There are subtle visual differences. Super Famicom runs at a lower resolution with fewer colors, for instance, but the primary difference stems from the amount of time it takes the CPU opponents to make their move. Super Famicom also loses the CD quality soundtrack, of course. Sounds like an MSU1 patch waiting to happen. So it's a perfectly serviceable game of Mahjong, just with a bland presentation. Now, Chat Noir's other game, produced by Sunsoft, was clearly banking more on the new hardware with its virtual mode. This is what we saw earlier with high-quality 3D renders of colorful characters huddled around a Mahjong table. It's rather impressive to behold, honestly, and was likely the big selling point here. But there's also a standard mode which displays the board in 2D. Unlike Mahjong Goku Tenjiku, this version uses the PlayStation's high-resolution interlaced mode and looks much sharper. So if you were all the way into Mahjong games in the mid-90s, Sha Noir had your back. They seemingly dominated the market when it came to Mahjong games. And there it is, the 1994 launch of the Sony PlayStation in Japan. These eight games marked the beginning of what would go on to become one of the most successful gaming consoles ever released. Over the next few months, publishers would unleash a wide range of games across many genres as sales began to pick up, yet the race was still neck and neck between Saturn and PlayStation. This battle was just beginning, and thus the plans to launch PlayStation in the West got underway. Nineteen ninety five was a wild time for the North American video game market. As Saturn and PlayStation arrived in Japan, Sega launched the thirty two X add on for its Sega Genesis system, while the three DO and Atari Jaguar were still dueling it out. Of the three, the three DO probably found the most success, but none of them did exceptionally well. 
With such a wide range of machines on the shelves, consumers were rightfully skeptical, I might say, but anyone keeping up with gaming magazines of that era knew that the PlayStation and Saturn had a lot of potential, and what was up with Nintendo's Ultra 64? For Sony, though, a key event occurred in May of 1995 at the very first E3. It was at this show that both Sega and Sony would unveil further details regarding the planned launches of these two machines. Sega went first. Tom Kalinske famously went up on stage and announced that Saturn would be available immediately at a retail price of 399 US dollars. Problem is, shipments were limited, partners were left out, and developers really weren't ready for launch. So the Saturn launched with very few games at a steep price. Sony took advantage of this, and after its own showcase, Steve Race, who was spearheading the US launch of PlayStation, got up on stage and uttered one word. $299? Yes, yeah, Sony would sell PlayStation for $100 less than the Sega Saturn, and would stick to its planned September release date, as Sega was initially planning to do. The thing is, while this $100 difference seems significant on paper, when you add in the required memory card for saving data and the fact that the PlayStation did not ship with an included game like the Saturn did, uh, the difference in value is not so clear cut. Still, it was effective. I love the Sega Saturn. It's one of my favorite systems of all time, but there's no doubt that mismanagement in North America ultimately crippled its success in the West. And Sony definitely took full advantage of this. In fact, with the Saturn already on the market, but with very few games available to consumers, they basically had the whole summer to advertise the arrival of the Sony PlayStation this fall. It did so with a range of cryptic commercials and in-your-face marketing, many of which were kind of bizarre, but at least intriguing. Say hello to Sophia. <laughs> now say goodbye. You are not ready. But in general, the tone of the marketing, it was going after that MTV generation, and it was perfect for this era. It definitely resonated with potential customers. By this point, Sony had also adopted Sophia from Battle Arena Toshinden as its mascot with some very in-your-face and provocative ads. This comes after ditching Polygon Man as its initial mascot, likely at the behest of Ken Kutaragi, who was displeased with the fact that he did not use Goro shading and was instead flat shaded. The stage was set then, and on 9995, the PlayStation launched in North America. On launch day, the PlayStation arrived with a decent selection of titles. Despite the push for 3D graphics though, many of these games are more traditional 2D titles. At launch, American games shipped in long box cases with three different variants, clear plastic like the Sega CD, plastic with paper inserts, and cardboard. The US also received a larger selection of titles at launch than any other region, with many more to follow. But before we get into the fresh new lineup, let's quickly jump back to one of the stars of the launch lineup, Ridge Racer. Yes, Ridge Racer was still a big deal when it launched in the US, but the reason I bring it up again is due to the perception of this game versus Sega Saturn. You see, released just a few months prior on Sega Saturn, Daytona USA basically served as Sega's answer to Ridge Racer, and it was equally important. Problem is, Daytona USA runs on a more powerful arcade board, the Sega Model 2, and translating this game to the Saturn proved, predictably, rather difficult. The port itself is very playable, but it runs at just 20 frames per second and loses a lot of detail along the way. This became one of those comparison points back in the day, though. People did not necessarily even understand what frame rate was, but it was clear that Ridge Racer was just a smoother game. It also perceptually looked closer to the arcade original, even if in reality both ports weren't quite on par. It's just that Sega's Model 2 was so advanced at this point that no home console could ever hope to compete, and this tarnished Saturn's image early on, even though it's still a fun port. 
Namco's US marketing team sure had some weird ideas for the packaging though. Just take a look at this back cover image. I suspect that this was originally designed to be the game's cover art, but thankfully cooler heads prevailed. Expectedly, Ridge Racer was a huge success in the US as well, and it's just the beginning of what would become Namco's legacy on the PlayStation platform. But our next game has a very different origin. Are, are there uh, any other games we could play? Shut up, Bobby. You always were a pain in the <laughs> this is Total Eclipse Turbo from Crystal Dynamics. Yes, the same Crystal Dynamics still around today. And, well, it's not a good game. But it is an interesting one. You see, in the mid 90s, flight games were a huge deal, especially space flight. The idea of piloting a vehicle through endless space was appealing enough, but like others, I'd imagine. I pined for the chance to buzz the surface of an alien planet. And Total Eclipse promises to deliver just that. And this is where the 3DO comes into play. You see, Crystal Dynamics had been there from the beginning with games like Crash and Burn, and one of its first big follow-up games was Total Eclipse. Players were tasked with flying a ship across the surface of various environments, while occasionally infiltrating tunnels along the way. This game arrived sometime early in 1994, about a year after Star Fox on Super NES. Now, the leap in visual fidelity from Star Fox was significant and expected, but this game was more of a death blow for the likes of the Atari Jaguar with Cybermorph. I can imagine games like this causing a panic within Atari HQ as it demonstrated a clear advantage in favor of 3DO, still early in both consoles' lives. While Crystal found decent success on 3DO with a wide range of titles, the system just wasn't to last, and the studio got to work on bringing its games over to the Saturn and PlayStation. Total Eclipse Turbo on PlayStation is its first release to make the jump. Problem is, this port is pretty much completely broken. It turns out that slapping the word Turbo onto the Turbo Eclipse name is kind of a bad joke, yet it perfectly describes the issues with this game. Fundamentally, it runs too fast. You see, on 3DO, this is actually a pretty decent game. It's fun, controls well enough, and looks fantastic for the system. On the PlayStation, however, it's a twitchy mess that's virtually impossible to enjoy. So what's going on? Well, from what I can tell, the game speed is tied directly to frame rate. That means the higher the frame rate, the faster the game. The PlayStation version manages to run at a faster frame rate, but the game itself was not adjusted or designed for this. In the very first level, you'll immediately notice a difference. Moving the ship around on PlayStation, it sort of just zips to the left and right and up and down, just tapping the D-pad lightly, while on 3DO, you actually get the impression that you're controlling a vehicle in a 3D space. But when you arrive at the first tunnel section, that's when you begin to suspect there's an issue. You see on 3DO, the tunnel entrance sequence plays out like this. A little choppy, but it seems intentional. On PlayStation, however, it completes almost instantaneously and it just looks awkward and sped up. The real problems become evident once you enter these tunnels. On PlayStation, even with the ship running at the slowest possible speed, it's almost impossible to control. Even tapping the D-pad is too much and it sends your ship slamming into the nearest wall. The level design itself is the same, but it was clearly not designed to be played like this. These same sections on 3DO run at a much lower frame rate, which on the surface seems like a bad thing, but in this case it actually makes it possible to control. Basically, it would appear that the level designers built these challenges specifically around the lower frame rate of the 3DO version. The entire game suffers from this issue. On 3DO, I pretty much plowed through the first few stages without losing any lives, but on PlayStation, it was just constant death due to slamming into walls and exploding from bullets that you cannot dodge. I almost have to wonder if the turbo part of the name was selected due to this. Sir, we can't fix the game in time for launch, it's just too fast. Eh, we'll just slap the name turbo on the box and make it a feature. It's a shame really, as this isn't a bad game at its core. It's a little unrefined, but on 3DO, it feels nice enough to play, and it was a technical showpiece. The ship is not overly sensitive to control, and challenges can be overcome. On PlayStation, it's just broken in comparison. Beyond this, the sound seems to be played back in mono on PlayStation with extra compression. 
unlike 3DO where it's full stereo and much cleaner. The game does not seem to use Redbook audio as popping it into a CD player yields no playable track, suggesting that there was a conversion issue when porting the music over to the PlayStation. But hey, at least you get this interesting uh, advertisement section. Hey pal, walk it off! The only advantage here is that FMV quality is slightly better on the PlayStation. But overall, Total Eclipse Turbo simply takes what was once a solid shooter and turns it into one of the worst launch games for the PlayStation. This is one time where a higher frame rate is not something desirable. Ridge Racer might have been the poster child during the PlayStation launch period, but for others such as myself, Battle Arena to Shinden was the killer app which fired up the fighting game fans to get the system on day one. The fighting game craze was well underway since the release of Street Fighter 2 in 1991, which had spawned a plethora of copycats to the point of near fatigue only a few years into the genre. On the other hand, Sega had reignited a lot of the interest in the genre with the jump to 3D with Virtua Fighter, a technically impressive though fundamentally different type of fighting game with its heavy reliance on counters and heightened realism. So while the market was rife with choice, none caught your eye as vividly as Toshinden, which in the ad campaign seemed to be promising a highly colorful, fast-paced fighting experience. Battle Arena Toshinden released in Japan already in January of 1995, missing out on the launch ever so slightly. The success of the game, as well as the excellent use of the hardware, was what would come to influence Sony's decision to make Toshinden the center point of their ad campaigns in the US market by September. And indeed, if you look at the magazines at the time, you'll see Toshinden front and center, especially the roster member of Sophia. Essentially becoming the mascot for the platform with some quite questionable marketing ideas. But is it any good? Let's jump into the arena and find out. Developed by the newly formed Tamsoft, a company that was comprised by members from Capcom, Toa Plan, and other companies, Battle Arena to Shinden featured fully 3D rendered graphics and a roster of eight traveling fighters, a 10 if you count the unlockables, and puts high emphasis on weapons. Now, the introduction of weapons to a fighting game wasn't entirely new to the genre. In fact, Street Fighter itself had characters such as Claw and Eagle who made use of weapons for extra range, and even games like Weapon Lord on the 16-bit platforms brought weapons into the mix. Toshinden, however, brings a new dimension, uh, quite literally, into the mix by allowing for much more variation in the weapon's size, range, and speed from the full 3D space. Gameplay-wise, Toshinden lands somewhere in the middle of Street Fighter and Virtua Fighter. Like Street Fighter, the game focuses on fast combos, mixing heavy and light attacks, special moves and projectiles, as well as super moves that can be pulled off in desperation in the heat of the fight. On the other side of the coin, Toshinden makes full use of the 3D playfield by allowing for dashing, running offensives, and dodging in and out of the playfield, giving the game a full 360 option of maneuverability. The game also makes use of an elevated ring, which the fighters can fall off of, which actually plays heavily into the usage of the special moves and how they position both you and the opponent by performing them. It isn't quite the Virtua Fighter killer that the ad team claimed it to be back then, much to the annoyance of the developer, but in 1995, this was a marvel to behold. One area in which I personally think Toshinden exceeds Virtua Fighter, and indeed many of the other fighting game competitors at the time, is in its presentation. With designs handled by famed designer Kotobuki, the game employs an incredibly vibrant palette that brings the characters to life via some great texture work and bright color usage, as well as full 3D background arenas that can move and even change over time. The performance is pretty stable, and there's very little in the way of slowdown. There are transparencies on some of the costumes, and the shared details on the character models and their weapons makes each and every member of the roster recognizable and memorable. Now you might not like the Shinden per se, but you surely remember what the characters look like, and I dare you to tell me if you remember a single character from a game like Survival Arts. 
In this regard, Toshinden even exceeds the eventual death blow to the series in Tekken, which while running much smoother and of course being the much better game overall, Toshinden's costumes, voicing, and actual facial expression makes it feel much more alive than what I feel Tekken does. The music is another highlight and has a somewhat complicated history to it, which we one day will have to tell you about. But in this western version, the game sports a completely redone soundtrack with live instrumentation and some really solid character themes and sound effects. The English voice acting is a bit goofy, but overall it's quite well done and mixed well on top of that. So this might all sound quite good, and generally for the time, I think it is. Joe Redifer. But naturally, the game is not by any means perfect, and by today's standards, it isn't the most enjoyable competitive fighters on the system. The controls are slow and have inherent lag, the variety of weapons, which is a nice touch, don't get me wrong, it exhibits some balancing issues, just to put it mildly, and yeah, overall, it's clunky. There is so much more I want to say about the Shinden that, indeed, I think we have to revisit this series in the future so I can get it all off my chest and give the series a well-deserved second appraisal, as well as getting into those sweet comparisons with the other versions that eventually would come out. But I think for now we can say that upon release, this was a must-have for the system and well deserving of the praise it got, and still today it holds some generally great visual designs and music, and the series would grow better despite its stiff competition, as well as its stiff beginnings. But make no mistakes about it, I love me some Tushinden. For my money, Rayman might just be the best launch title available for the PlayStation. But then again, I have a fondness for this one as I did spend a lot of time playing it back in the day. I think it holds up however. It's a gorgeous 2D pixel art platformer created by Ubisoft. In fact, this is the game that put them on the map for me in the first place. The history of Rayman is long and complex though, having been in development first for Super NES, there's a leaked prototype showcasing what might have been, and it is decidedly different from the final game. Rayman was eventually shifted over to other platforms though for the next generation of consoles, namely PlayStation, Sega Saturn, Atari Jaguar, and the PC. There was even a Sega 32X version announced and shown at E395, but alas, there's nothing more available on this one. At its core, Rayman basically tasks you with exploring a wide range of worlds while rescuing Electoons from these cages. You'll need to find them to unlock the final area, however, which is extremely difficult. In fact, the entire game is brutal, and it's really just thanks to muscle memory at this point that I'm able to play through it so well. What really appeals to me about Rayman, though, beyond the core gameplay, is the presentation. The worlds are unbelievably detailed and beautifully realized, with multiple layers of parallax scrolling and huge objects. It may have been a 2D game, but it demonstrated what this new generation of machines could offer for side-scrolling platformers. You were not going to get visuals this detailed on the Super NES, that's for sure. It also sounds great. The CD audio score is exceptionally well done, with so many great tracks across the game. What really makes Rayman so fascinating to me personally are the differences between the various versions. Let me be clear here, there are few games from this era with as many version differences as Rayman. Each and every iteration of the game differs from the others in multiple ways, and this is something I'd like to explore today. Obviously PlayStation is the focus of this episode, but Rayman's release was rather scattered. The Jaguar version seems to have been completed first, but its launch was held back and it ultimately released around the same time as the PlayStation version. The Saturn release then came later on that year, while the PC version didn't arrive until the following spring. So what have we got? 
Well, from the beginning, you'll notice some differences. The Jaguar version uses a completely different background, which is something you should get used to, while the PC background is pushed upward. When you reach the end of this stage, though, we see another bizarre difference, the transitional animation and sound. On PlayStation, you get this. Yeah! <laughs> On Saturn, it's similar, but the music is extended and you get this fancy animation effect. With PC, you get the yeah from Rayman, but no additional music, just the main track. Yeah! Then on the JEG, you get uh, uh, this, this rather poor sounding victory jingle without the yeah. Okay, next stage. Again, similar, but there are slight color variations between the four due to how palettes are handled, I'd imagine. It is similar though. But check this out, on most versions when you collect the blue orbs, they break apart with this little particle shower. Looks great, right? Well on the JEG, this wasn't implemented at all, you just get a sparkle sprite instead. Further ahead, the Jaguar version is also missing this pink plant, something we'll see throughout the game. This is likely due to these larger background elements consuming too much memory for the cartridge. And just in case you weren't familiar, yes, the Jaguar version did ship on a cartridge, not a CD. This stage also illustrates the difference in the way music is handled. PlayStation uses a series of short tracks stored as Redbook audio on the disc, but some stages rely on the system's sound processor to generate tunes instead. Listen to this little drum beat in the stage. On Saturn, all stage music is run from the CD as Redbook audio. This is usually true for PlayStation, of course, but in stages such as this, with the drum beat, Saturn uses this ambient track instead. Okay, now PC is even stranger. CD audio on the PC was weird, and that seeking to the next track could pause many PCs of that era, causing the game to freeze momentarily. I believe to combat this, Ubisoft simply assembled all the various music pieces together into these longer tracks with ambient sound between them. As a result, from the perspective of the player, you always start most of these stages with the same basic song, but it does transition into other pieces if you play long enough. And then on Jaguar, uh, okay, let me just be upfront about this, the Jaguar soundtrack is terrible. It barely resembles the CD audio, and honestly, it destroys the atmosphere. There are fewer tracks in this game overall, and they all sound kinda like this. Really, it's not great. Moving on, the next stage showcases a bizarre difference, cage placement. They moved this cage on PC, it's just not there, and this is a new save, not a previously loaded one. You may have also noticed that the PlayStation version features this nice fog effect thanks to its alpha blending capabilities. This is missing from all other versions. Moving on to the next stage though, we see all four using the same background for once, but the thing is on Jaguar, the backgrounds are all simplified. Every other version has multiple layers scrolling independently to increase the perception of parallax, but on the Jag, it's just a flat bitmap without any of this detail. After this then, we do see another variation. PlayStation and Jaguar use a brighter background here for this boss fight, one that doesn't have the vertical scrolling as you jump down to him. Meaning, I don't really think it fits as well in these two original versions. Saturn and PC have the edge. The next stage is even crazier though. PC gets this little transitional animation before the level for starters, but once you're in the stage, you'll note differences in backgrounds again, as well as these red spiked fruits on the PC versus the yellow ones on other versions. Most noticeably though, the stage is completely different on Jaguar. You can actually shoot from Mosquito himself rather than relying on Rayman's fist. Also, the other versions start out slow, but at a certain point you hit this speed up point and the music changes, at least on the two consoles, not on PC. Again, these differences are just fascinating, aren't they? Then comes one of my favorite parts, this vertical plant climb section. Here you are handed a seed from Tar Raisan and then use it to plant flowers to make your way to the top. On Saturn and PlayStation, this sequence is handled beautifully. It's dark and rainy and when you plant the first seed, the music kicks in. I love it.
PC seems like it could have been even better thanks to the simulated flashes of lightning. It does look good, but the problem is, due to how the music is stored on the disc, you get this song instead. It really doesn't fit the mood, does it? The Jaguar though, uh, once again, atmosphere is sucked right out of the room. The rain effect is gone and the same poor rendition of the opening stage music is used. Alright, I'm going a little overboard with these comparisons, I know, but let me get one more in. The first stage of Bandland. It's like this, right? Okay, so the backgrounds differ between Saturn and PlayStation, but they're basically the same stage. Jaguar and PC though, well, on the Jag it looks like the same stage on the surface, but the sliding mechanic hasn't been implemented at all. So it feels completely different, almost like a Chinese bootleg version of Rayman. On PC, however, this entire stage was replaced with this new gorgeous sequence. Why? I have no idea, but I'll be darned if it doesn't look amazing. There's also the matter of loading. To the Jaguar version's credit, it doesn't really have any. It's very quick, thanks to running off a cartridge. But it's actually nearly as quick on the other consoles as well. It only needs to load when you load the first stage of any specific world. And when it does load, you get a nice loading screen, which kind of differs between Saturn and PlayStation as well. The Jaguar version has a few other variations in terms of stage design as well, specifically later in the game. So there is some exclusive content there, which is neat. But okay, I could go on for an hour or more about Rayman, but we really need to stop here. The point is, Rayman is an excellent game on all platforms, but it is not equal between them. The PlayStation version is solid and kind of right in the middle. There are a few things about it I don't love, which is why I feel the Sega Saturn version is the best of the four. It just feels the most polished and refined overall. That said, no matter where you play it, Rayman is a brilliant game, and one day, I hope to go further in depth with the series, as you can tell, I just adore it. With that said, let's move on to the next game. It's time for a real battle. On film, even. Street Fighter's popularity by 995 could not be understated, and the game had reignited not only the game centers worldwide, but by now become a system seller and even a feature film. Sony's US launch would be the very first console launch to be able to say they would have a Street Fighter game on day one, which under any circumstance would be a dream case scenario for a platform manufacturer. However, the game we got is anything but an ordinary Street Fighter affair. The story is probably familiar to many of you, but let's just do a small recap. In 1994, action film legend Steve De Sousa directed Street Fighter, an all-assembled cast film based on the video game with Jean-Claude Van Damme in the lead as Willem Guile, and Raul Julia as M. Bison, among many others. The film was a smash hit, and while over the years it's been derided as a bad movie and criticized for all those changes they had to make to make it work on the silver screen, it's a movie that in recent years has gotten a much better reputation as a fun action flick with great comedic timing, good action, and in some cases, amazing performances. In fact, if you want to know more about this movie, check out our friends at 88 Films. They got a Blu-ray of Street Fighter and I hear there's some familiar faces doing the commentary track and bonus features on it. But anyway, let's get back to the game. On set, the American developer Incredible Technologies had full access to the sets, props, costumes, and even the principal cast for the film to be digitized for the development of a brand new Street Fighter game, codename at the time, Street Fighter 3. Well, at least most of the time they had the actors. I hear Van Damme was pr apparently pretty busy showing Kylie Minogue as Thailand, so it might be a stunt fan in there. Headed by Alan Noon, this was to be a game that faced the competition in Mortal Kombat head-on with its use of digitized graphics, though retaining the tight Street Fighter gameplay the series had become known for by this time. Noon actually requested access to the source code for Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo from Capcom. However, Capcom on their side was quite wary of allowing any outside developers to see how the sausage is made. 
and instead gave Noon's team the actual cabinet for Street Fighter 2 Turbo on the set and told them to learn from it and make a game based on their experiences playing it, but not any direct access. The results in the arcade game, well, I think this is well known. This is not a good Street Fighter game. Though the team does deserve praise for some absolutely incredible animation and clean digitized graphics. It just does not feel like Street Fighter at all, and the game actually is well too animated for its own good. Even the controls and commands were slightly altered. So while it's a novel attempt, understandably flawed due to the time constraints and difficult development conditions, Street Fighter the movie, the game, the arcade version, didn't quite live up to the intended Street Fighter 3 that they hoped they could make. But the console version is not the same as the arcade version. Developed internally at Capcom of Japan, parts of the original Street Fighter development team took Noon's footage and reappropriated it into the Street Fighter 2 Turbo engine. Yes, essentially Capcom did exactly what Noon had intended to do from the beginning. The look and feel of the game takes a completely different approach as a result, with a large number of animation frames cut down to fit the original frame data in the original arcade game, as well as manually touching up frames of digitized footage to more closely resemble the moves from the original Street Fighter game. The results are basically a fully featured, authentic Street Fighter experience with a new coat of paint, complete with a new soundtrack, new stages for each character taken from the movie, and as you can see here, it looks completely different from the arcade version of the movie. But Capcom didn't just slap on some new graphics into the game and call it a day. There are actually additions to the core gameplay here. The Super Specials allow players to make use of a boosted variation of the regular Super Moves, often in the form of like two successive projectiles and the likes. And it's a feature that would actually make its way into the Street Fighter 3 down the line, uh, kinda, sorta. Additionally, the game retains most of the actual special moves that can be found in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and the controls are the same tried and true commands. Reversals, tech, it's all here. The game's roster consists of most of the World Warriors found in the arcades, though Dalsum is noticeably absent, though he can be seen right here in the background on Blanca's stage. And nobody wants to play as Dalsum anyway. Blade, a shadowless Lewis soldier that was playable in the arcades, is absent as well, though Blanca, who was not in the arcade game, makes his appearance here, though strangely without his completed makeup from the film. There is of course the addition of Savada, played by screen legend Savada Kenji, in his one and only appearance in the series. Akuma even makes an appearance here if you know how to find him. What's pretty cool here for me at least is that he's played by Ernie Ray Sr., the father of Ernie Ray Jr. You know, Kato from Team NT2 and Satch and Richard Ledbetter's favorite film, Surf Ninjas. The biggest addition that Street Fighter the movie brings to the series, however, is the single player components. Let's start here with the movie mode. Here, players take on the film's plot interspliced with footage from the film and dialogue sequences prior to each fight. There are even branching paths here for variety, though it's not quite the Streetvania game we've all been hoping for as there are limits to how many paths you can take. What's kinda neat about this is that the game actually makes use of cut materials from the script for these scenarios, and actually also makes use of promotional stills that at least I have not seen used anywhere else. Throughout this mode, a timer counts down as Bison demands his ransom on the hostages, so as William Guile, you have to make your way to Bison and stop him before the time is over. It would actually take years before Street Fighter again made use of a proper adventure mode, so it's really cool to see here in 1995. For the more familiar Street Battle, the arcade mode essentially. There are no big surprises here. Make your way through the other warriors, beat Bison, get the individual endings. There's the mandatory versus mode here, as is the brand new trial mode. This is basically an early attempt at the survival mode, and the goal here is to get as far as you can with the character of choice, and the AI being upped with each successive victory. After defeat then, you get a score and ranking determined by skill. Again, this is pretty neat to see. So the music and graphics, of course, that's the outlier here. Now I think if you like it or not, it's very specifically tied to how you feel about the original film, but for myself, who has a ton of love for the film still to this day, it was incredibly exciting to see all the actors appear in the game, especially Van Damme. This is actually a rare game appearance for him outside of like Time Cop on a Super Nintendo, and for me who emulated the man by doing splits in front of girls to impress them, though I only impressed the other boys in the class somehow. The game's graphics really don't bother me at all, even as a Street Fighter aficionado, I find them quite cool. The music is also entirely original and is a proper Capcom production with some pretty good original tunes, though I suspect no one will want to pick this over the original Street Fighter soundtrack, but you can't deny that this is pretty banging.
The sound effects and voices, however, are largely forgettable, though interestingly they have been entirely changed from their arcade original game, which used the original actor's voice whenever possible, whereas the console version here has some quite generic grunts and punts. <laughs> So yeah, it's a bit of a shame that this game spent so much time being relegated to the back of the class of Street Fighter games, when all in all is a pretty decent entry into this series, and a launch game at that. Do I think this should be at the main event of EVO anytime soon? Uh, maybe not. But I do think it deserves some high praise for its good gameplay, slight experimentation with the super move system, and, a, and pretty robust single player options for the time. The game also saw a release on the Sega Saturn during this time, though the differences are marginal. The biggest difference can be seen here in the video playback capabilities. The PlayStation looks pretty decent, while the Sega Saturn version has noticeably more noise and artifacting on the videos, as well as some dropped frames here and there. But overall, you can't go wrong with either version. Now many are probably aware of what is generally considered to be the superior Street Fighter film, The Legend of Chan Li. Hold on, that's Rich's other favorite film. I mean, Street Fighter the animated movie. And that game also did get a game adaptation, though this one is a weird full motion video hybrid with some short fight sequences in the 2 Turbo Engine as well. But the Street Fighter movie game is the superior game experience. We didn't even get to talk about the best part of this game yet. Beat the game in movie mode and you're treated to the music video by legendary duo Chaga and Asuka with their song Something There. It's a great song, and indeed when it comes to Street Fighter the movie, the console game, there is. Something there. The Raiden Project joins Parodius Deluxe Pack as an early example of what these new consoles could do for classic arcade games. In this case, Seibu Kaihatsu ported the game themselves directly from the arcade originals. I say games, by the way, because the Raiden project includes both the original Raiden and its sequel, Raiden 2, which was previously unavailable on home consoles and in fact was only available via emulation as of several years ago due to heavy encryption. When you first pop the game in, then you're greeted with this menu featuring 3D polygonal ships in the background. It feels like the developers are experimenting with 3D graphics just to see what was possible on the system. But of course, the main games themselves are entirely 2D affairs, making this yet another pixel art game available at launch. Which is awesome, of course. The quality of the conversion work here is simply superb. It looks and plays every bit as good as the arcade originals, and has the option to use an arranged soundtrack. Both games look and run like an absolute dream, and hold up very well today. In bringing the game to North America, however, there were some notable changes. Firstly, this menu is now available at any time in-game, while in the Japanese version it can only be accessed from the main menu of each title. One of the more curious additions is the screen width option. By changing the width of the image, you're basically cycling the output resolution of the PlayStation. PS1 Digital's menu shows that it cycles between 256, 320, 384, and 512 pixel wide modes, with 384 serving as the default and best option. When played in this default orientation, this is one of those games that fills the entirety of the 240 pixel height of the PlayStation's output, which means the score data spills out into the overscan region. Another change though involves the horizontal slash arcade slash tate mode. In the Japanese original, by selecting the so-called arcade mode, the screen is rotated, allowing you to play the game with your TV turned on its side, much like a game center. There is a warning in Japanese when you select this mode, but it works exactly as Tate modes should. The US version retains this option, but the game explicitly tells you not to turn your TV on its side, instead asking you to play it like a horizontal shooter. What does this mean? Well, basically if you did turn your TV on its side, you won't be able to play the game as the controls really are configured to make it play like a horizontal shooter with no option to change them. Bummer. While Raiden 2 was not widely ported, the original game sure was. Due to the already massive scope of this episode though, I can't test every version, but I do have the Atari Jaguar version on cart, which just happens to have been a launch game for that system as well. And this comparison is fascinating. Unlike the PlayStation version, the Jaguar port was developed in the US by Imagitech Design, 
and it's heavily compromised. It runs at just 30 frames per second instead of 60, and plays noticeably slower overall. The art was entirely retooled with its own color palette and this giant sidebar added to the mix. It's a slightly unfair comparison, I suppose, but keep in mind that the Jaguar was still in the market and intended to compete with this new generation of machines. It's disappointing that a game like this would launch at just 30 FPS on the Jag, though. They even tease you with this intermission scene before the game begins, which does run at 60. As soon as the game proper begins, though, it's 30 FPS, just like other Imagitech design conversions such as Pitfall the Mine Adventure. At least the sound is okay on the Jaguar. But the PlayStation version is also a step ahead there. So yeah, the Raiden Project. It's a great launch title for PlayStation, and along with the other 2D games, still holds up today and is well worth playing. If Tate mode is important to you, however, I recommend the Japanese version, even with its slightly reduced feature set. But this was not the only arcade conversion available at launch. Welcome to NBA Jam Tournament Edition, one of the best arcade titles of the early 90s, and an update to vanilla NBA Jam from 1993. Like Mortal Kombat before it, NBA Jam was a huge hit for American developer Midway, and as someone that usually didn't enjoy sports games, this one certainly grabbed my attention. It's basically a game of two-on-two -two basketball with a focus on slam dunks. You can run, jump, shoot, block, and, well, jam. Hold the turbo button and your shoes light up, increasing your capabilities leading to some killer dunks. The fast pace of this game is addictive and it arrived at a time when the sport of basketball itself was at its most prominent, perhaps. The timing simply couldn't have been better. And yes, you can play as Bill Clinton. It was the 90s, what are you gonna do? It's also a nice looking game with off-model proportioned versions of your favorite basketball stars running back and forth across a reflective court with excellent line scrolling and parallax background scrolling. The dunks have the same impact as the uppercut in Mortal Kombat, I'd say. Midway really excelled in drawing just the right keyframes. NBA Jam arrived on just about every platform under the sun. Of all the games we've examined today, this is the one with the most ports, by far. NBA Jam TE is available on 10 different platforms, if you count the arcade machine. Naturally, the arcade board powering Jam was more powerful than any of the 16-bit machines of its era, and it ran at a resolution of 400 by 254 meaning artwork had to be cut down in size and detail. The first home releases were solid conversions, but a far cry from the arcade original, while the handheld versions were… interesting. Which is why NBA Jam TE makes for such a promising launch title with the arrival of PlayStation. We could finally experience the arcade version at home, right? Well, not quite, but almost. Let's be clear, NBA Jam Tournament Edition on PlayStation and Saturn is the best home conversion of this game as far as I'm concerned, but it isn't quite the same. The resolution is reduced to 320x240 and there are tweaks to the assets as well. As a result, the playfield is slightly zoomed in, and player sprites appear larger than ever. Yet even with these differences, it feels close enough to the arcade original, and it recreates the razzle-dazzle of playing NBA Jam. This version also introduces a stunning CD-quality soundtrack, which I feel exceeds the arcade game and adds a lot to the experience, something we'll listen to momentarily. But I was curious, if you were buying a PlayStation on day one, you'd probably want to know how well this version of the game stacks up against every other version. I certainly expected it to be better, but I wanted to see for myself. So early in 95, the first wave of Tournament Edition arrived for 16-bit consoles and the Game Gear, at least as far as I can tell. Release date information around this time is a little bit scattered. These versions are as you'd expect. The sprites are smaller, they use fewer colors, the sound quality is reduced, 
but it still maintains the essence of NBA Jam. Note that as we move through these comparisons, the PlayStation version will serve as the base here since this is the focus of the episode, even though it's not quite arcade perfect. Music though is something I really want to discuss when talking about each version because I think it makes a big difference. Firstly, let's listen to that arcade original. Now, here's the PlayStation version with the CD quality soundtrack. Welcome to NBA Jam! Good William! Whether selecting your team or playing the game, it sounds fantastic on PlayStation and benefits from the enhanced audio. The 16-bit consoles fall rather short in comparison, but they're not terrible. Sega's version has some decent renditions of the original arcade music, Welcome to NBA Jam. but I'm not a huge fan of the sound used during gameplay. Super NES starts out pretty strong. But while playing the game, it's usually just sound effects, which feels a little odd. Then there's the 8-bit Game Gear version, which is interesting to see. It doesn't look great, but I feel it's a better conversion of this arcade game than, say, Mortal Kombat was on the Game Gear. But obviously, when it comes to audio, there isn't a lot you could have done with the PSG on Game Gear. From what I can tell then, the next version to arrive was the Game Boy version. It's ugly and difficult to play, but honestly, it's a pretty good conversion. This is the Game Boy after all, so you can't expect much. The detail levels take a huge hit, but it's still decidedly NBA Jam, and again, compared to Mortal Kombat, it runs a lot smoother. It's really not a bad conversion. And the sound is interesting. As expected, if the 16-bit machines couldn't match the arcade, you can't really expect that from the Game Boy, which has its own unique chiptune sound. Basically, both handheld versions feature similar music tracks done using the style of their specific sound hardware. Take a listen and see what you think. The next version is one I've already examined, the Sega 32X version. In that episode, I noted how the court graphics are handled using the Sega Genesis, while sprites are enhanced by the 32X itself. Thus, it feels like a hybrid. The players are larger and more colorful than its 16-bit counterpart, but the court side graphics are somewhat grainy. The sound, of course, is very similar to the Genesis version, and not especially great. Just after this though, the PlayStation version finally arrived, and as you can tell by now, it would have been the best of the bunch by far. It also was not the final port. NBA Jam TE would also arrive on Sega Saturn, Atari Jaguar, and PC CD-ROM. Firstly, the Saturn version. It's nearly identical to PlayStation. I did note some minor visual differences here and there, and a few changes to the transitions, but it's extremely close, and it plays very well. In fact, I prefer playing this version as the Saturn controller feels just right for NBA Jam. It has been noted that the difficulty for CPU opponents is backwards in both versions though, with increased difficulty settings yielding easier opponents and vice versa. Based on my experience playing though, it was slightly difficult to say for sure. Then there's the Atari Jaguar version, and oh boy, this is an odd one. Ported by high voltage software, 
this should have been a fantastic conversion, and in fact it does play well, but there are some issues which I feel hold it back. It is important to stress however that this was programmed primarily by one person in about four months. Knowing this, it's kind of a miracle that it turned out as well as it did, and actually runs at 60 frames per second, unlike many other 2D Jaguar games. It also has its own unique look compared to every other version, the camera works slightly differently, and the sprite work is bespoke. It features the larger sprites similar to say 32X, but with much more colorful court graphics. Problem is, I noted some weird behavior from the AI. While playing, the CPU teammates would often just stop moving until the shot clock ran out. Something that I did not encounter in any other version. Is it unique to this version? I'm not entirely sure, but that's what happened. I also found the AI opponents to be ridiculously easy compared to every other version for some reason. My big complaint though stems from the audio. Like the handheld games, completely new music was composed for this version. Fine on paper, but the problem is, these tunes do not fit NBA Jam at all. Case in point, on PlayStation, this is the music you get during the team selection. Welcome to NBA Jam! Showtime! Tonight's matchup, Lakers versus Cavaliers! But on the Jaguar, you get this instead. Tonight's matchup, Bulls versus Sixers. Okay, not too bad. Or what about in-game? On PlayStation, again, it's like this. Good Williams! Jams it in! On the Jag, though, you get these weird drum beats and strange tunes that feel kind of out of place. Or how about this song here? I don't know, I understand that every version sounds different. The 16-bit and handheld versions in particular aren't great, but I was really surprised again by just how poor the Jaguar version sounds. It was true with Rayman, and it's true here. At least Raiden wasn't bad. If there's one area where the CD-based versions fall down slightly though, it's loading times. They're not long, mind you, but compared to say the Jaguar version or the 16-bit console versions, it does take a little time to move from the menu to the game. The PC CD-ROM version is last, and surprisingly this port is different as well. While it features the CD audio soundtrack used in the PlayStation version, the visuals have been changed in significant ways. Firstly, the parallax scrolling and background animation have been completely removed. It's now just a static bitmap. No court scrolling, no background layers, or perspective swaps on the backboard. Really, it's just like running back and forth on a desktop wallpaper. The sprites are much smaller too, compared to Saturn and PlayStation, and heck, even the Jaguar. But there's an option to scale them down to 60% if you want to make them even smaller. Even more bizarre, I couldn't find a way to quit from an in-progress game. There's no mention of this in the manual, or nor any shortcut keys I could find. It was frustrating. As a 1996 release, this is slightly surprising, but it is perfectly playable, but it's a huge step down from the 32-bit console releases. So yeah, that's NBA Jam in a nutshell. It's an awesome game, and the PlayStation version is one of the best, which makes for a killer launch title. You know what's not a good sports launch game though? Power Serve 3D Tennis, courtesy of SPS and Ocean, is the only pure sports game at launch and brings you the exciting and high octane action of tennis. It also brings you what is decidedly the worst experience on the console on day one, and I'd say it remains pretty high on that list throughout the console's lifespan. This is a game you really gotta be stroking it hard in order to get any enjoyment out of, either by yourself or with a friend. Choosing from a set of four male or four female imaginary competitors, this is a game of tennis you'll soon forget. You'll have a limited option of either singles or double matches, though I suppose there aren't anything like Royal Rumbles or First Blood matches in tennis to begin with. 
and a set of three core types to plant your feet on. Now the game, that's where all the action is. Alright, so take a look at this. By default, the game makes use of the revolutionary ball cam. A full 3D camera that tracks the ball rather than the players, as placement and timing isn't really all that necessary in the game of tennis, I believe. But if you want to have more control and oversight for whatever reason, the game has you covered with this 360 spinning camera, which will continuously spin around the player itself, since ball placement and trajectory isn't really that central to what makes tennis the sport it is. Now the game runs at 60 frames per second, but if that's too good for you, you can easily have the performance with just a touch of a button. Yes, by enabling this nifty split-screen feature, you can now stroke it at 30 frames per second instead. If you really want a challenge, why not combine the split-screen with the spinning 360 camera for the full power serve experience? Now what really grinds my gears though is the lack of grunts and sound from the tennis players themselves. I don't know much about this sport, I do know John Madden is not a tennis player and that you're supposed to release all bodily function and animalistic desire with each stroke as you hit that ball as hard as you can. Here you only get this carnival barker music and sparse applause. 14. Game yeah, so there's really not much to enjoy here. There's not even much to say, other than the fact that I think someone should worry a lot about what's going to come to his mailbox over the next coming months, as I've actually played this now. But the one thing that can be done to improve the experience overall is to bring Sangeev's movie grunts into the picture. <laughs> much better, comrades. Well, that's enough power stroking for now. I think it's time to move on to the next game as quickly as we can. If Power Serve 3D Tennis wasn't your cup of tea, Sony itself had a more realistic option up its sleeve with ESPN Extreme Games. Grab your street gear and race across multiple tracks around the world while punching everything and everyone around you. Yep, this is basically Road Rash on inline skates. After reshuffling the organization, Sony ImageSoft was combined with part of Sony Computer Entertainment to form Sony Interactive Studios America, which would also eventually become known as 989 Studios. ESPN Extreme Games is one of its first titles, and honestly, it's surprisingly great. The ESPN branding also taps into that demographic Sony was aiming for with the launch of PlayStation. They were aiming for that cool factor, building off the then relatively new X Games hosted by ESPN, which encompassed various extreme sports. The game's front end is stylized after a garage, and it's here where you can pick your gear, including inline skates, skateboards, bicycles, and uh, the street luge, while also selecting your options. I appreciate the transitions between these two rooms in this menu. They're handled using Sony CRT monitors rendered as 3D objects which zoom in and out. A nice touch. CRT within a CRT anyone? Now in between races, optional full motion video sequences are played, either setting up the next race or chiding you for failure in the most 90s way possible. Yeah, I'm really glad we all wasted our time and came out here and watched you race like that. Congratulations, we have a new definition for slow. You! It really shows how times were starting to change though. Of all the launch games for the American PlayStation, only four of them have FMV sequences at all. And of those four, only two of them use real people. Now at its core, the game most closely resembles the 3DO version of Road Rash, which by the way, would arrive on PlayStation at a later date. The camera angle and methods used for rendering the world all appear very similar at a glance, lending the game an almost roller coaster like feel. All characters and objects within the world are sprites, and they manage to work pretty well within the context of this game. The feeling of gaining momentum while dodging objects and taking out your opponents is remarkably satisfying. Like Road Rash, there's a lot of emphasis on attacking your rivals as you make your way to the finish line, but there's also things like these ramps and gates to ride through which earn you points and money, plus there's tons of obstacles littering the tracks. All of this is backed by a rather forgettable soundtrack. This really could have used some nice mid-90s licensed tunes to capture that true X Games feel. 
What really helps this game stand out at launch though is the fluidity. The frame rate is shockingly stable and smooth. Coming from the beloved Road Rash on 3DO, the leap in performance makes a strong impression. Here's a fun fact though, despite being developed by a first party studio for the PlayStation, ESPN Extreme Games received a PC port in 1996, something they would do with various other games such as Twisted Metal 1 and 2. So how does it fare? Well, it's really not good, but we need to consider the context here. 1996 was a transitional time in the PC space. A lot of people were still using 486 based systems or slower. Pentiums were certainly on the rise, especially with the promise of Quake, but high performance 3D in the PC space wasn't exactly common. 3D cards were also in their infancy. In that sense, it feels like this conversion was designed for lower end PCs of this era. Now, this MS-DOS based game has a few disadvantages over the PlayStation then. Firstly, it runs in DOS mode X, which means 320 by 200 resolution with 8-bit color at 70 Hz. The reduction in color depth has an impact on the textures throughout. There's more visible banding and fewer shades of color. It's simply a less colorful game. It's also missing things like shadows on various trackside objects. Beyond this, the camera position is adjusted with the horizon shifted upwards versus the original perspective. I kind of prefer the PlayStation version here. It also has a rather low frame rate cap. This resolution delivers 70 hertz to the monitor, but the game itself seems to run at roughly 17.5 frames per second, or quarter rate. This was likely implemented to ensure consistency on slower PCs. But I captured this on a faster Pentium 3 system that is way over spec for this game. It simply didn't make a difference. The main menu, however, is not capped and it winds up running way too quickly. Plus, the sweet CRT transitions are completely changed, looking worse. And the FMV quality on top of that is hugely reduced as well. So yeah, it's not a great conversion for the PC. The PlayStation version though was a huge success and would receive multiple sequels. Re-releases of this game even had the ESPN branding stripped away and the title changed to One Extreme to fit in with Two Extreme and Three Extreme the two sequels. Ultimately, while not my favorite game at launch, it was a nice showpiece for the system and it holds up better than I expected. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for our final game in this territory. Kilik, the DNA Imperative, or Kilik the Blood, as it was known elsewhere, is the game designed to fill that first-person shooter void left at the launch of PlayStation. This was, after all, less than two years after Doom first exploded onto the PC, so it makes a lot of sense to launch a console with a first-person shooter. Problem is, Japanese developer Genki didn't really seem to have a handle on what made Doom and other popular FPS titles on the PC any good. As a result, Kilik shares more with old school dungeon crawlers, but without the depth, or something like Wolfenstein 3D, though it's not even that complex. Thinking about it, Kilik actually shares a lot with Crime Crackers, one of the Japanese launch titles, only it completely lacks the characters, the storytelling, and the extra RPG light mechanics. The game's story then is driven by these pre rendered CGI sequences that appear between and sometimes during missions. The player pilots an SJ-107 assault suit in first person while exploring each level. But ultimately, it's just a series of corridors. You explore the level, find access cards, and throw switches in an effort to unlock the exit elevator, bringing you to the next floor. Now at first glance, it looks nice. The view is full screen, it runs smoothly, and the textures are of good quality. Once you complete the first floor though, reality sets in. This is a very very repetitive game. Keyleak basically consists of corridors and small rooms. There is no variations in elevation and no angled walls. All walls form a 90 degree angle. It's basically just a bunch of lines on a grid. The only thing that changes when you move to a new stage are the textures and some of the world geometry, but they all share the same basic level structure. It quickly becomes boring. The combat itself doesn't help. When you encounter an enemy, you basically walk up to them and just keep mashing the fire button until they disappear. It's a war of attrition more than anything else, as you're often devoid of movement options. 
Of note, however, the soundtrack was composed by Kimitaka Matsumae, previously of Sega's SST band fame. Unlike many launch titles, however, KeyLeak's soundtrack relies on the PlayStation audio chip using sample data rather than pre-recorded digital audio. While there are no version comparisons to make for this game, it did have some competition, namely Robotica on the Saturn. I've always lumped these two games together. Both are science fiction first person shooters that have players piloting mech suits around claustrophobic maze-like environments while hunting for keys and riding elevators. And neither are very good. In the case of Robotica, however, the game does at least feature randomly generated stages, something I'm normally not a fan of, but when they already feel randomly generated in Kalik, some variety is welcome. Robotica also features visible weapons for your character, which really helps ground you in the game and is something I prefer. It's sorely missed in Kilik. I also prefer the overall aesthetic too, it's darker and creepier than Kilik. Unfortunately, when comparing the two side by side, it doesn't paint a nice picture of the Sega Saturn. Kilik manages to run at a mostly steady 30 frames per second while featuring 3D polygonal enemies. In comparison, Robotica struggles to hit the target 30 FPS, and all enemies are just 2D sprites rather than 3D objects. Plus, the draw distance is even shorter. So, it's a technical win for the PlayStation in this case, but whoever wins, we lose. Neither game holds up as far as shooters go. They're both early generation curiosities. Kilik would receive a pair of sequels, and they are noticeably better games, but, well, this is one series I never really managed to get into. And that marks the end of the US launch lineup, and the beginning of an empire. The astute among you, though, may be wondering, where are games like Air Combat? Well, Audi and I cross-checked dates across a wide range of sources, and the launch period was somewhat poorly documented in the US. From what we can tell, however, Air Combat was released just after launch. But knowing how shipping was back in the day, it may have shown up early in some cases. Either way, we're talking about Air Combat in the next section. Then there's the games that were delayed. If you find ads from this period, games like Discworld and Mortal Kombat 3, for instance, both seem to have been planned for launch, but both got pushed back. Which kind of raises an interesting point. After launch, PlayStation received a steady stream of new software, something that likely contributed to its success. In contrast, due to the surprise launch, no doubt, Sega Saturn received precious few. Launch Windows support is so critical when it comes to launching a new platform, and it's clear that Sega's lack of software during its critical post-launch period likely damaged its chances of success in the US. Which brings us to our final key territory, the European launch of the Sony PlayStation. As PlayStation came closer to launch in Europe, things were noticeably different about this console launch than the ones before it. One of the keys to these differences lay in the fact that Sony had their internal divisions in music, entertainment, and electronics, giving them a unique and powerful tool to tap directly into the sensibilities and interests of young adults. Rather than marketing themselves so heavily into the established gamers market that was already overpopulated and dominated by Nintendo and Sega's consoles, Sony leveraged the PlayStation as something more, something beyond just a gaming console. An event in itself that was cool, different, and much like getting a high-end Discman or having a super impressive sound system, a must-have for your entertainment center. This was an aspect that Nintendo and Sega simply could not compete with, as their general demographic and approach was geared towards the specific consumers of kids and young teenagers specifically looking for games. So I was working on Sega magazines in the UK back in 1994, and it was clear that a profound transition was upcoming. And I think ironically, it was Sega, not Sony, that brought it on. 
With its Model 1 and Model 2 arcade games, it was supremely obvious that the future of gaming was in 3D, not 2D. And the hunger to bring home titles like Virtua Fighter and Daytona USA was profound. But as the year progressed, the buzz behind PlayStation started to gain momentum. Contacts of mine started to see behind the scenes demos for PlayStation and were blown away by what they saw. The positivity was infectious and quickly spread to the press and then to gamers. Meanwhile, it wasn't so clear cut what was actually happening with Sega. The 32X initiative didn't really have any kind of enthusiasm behind it at all. Rumours that the Saturn was being revamped to stand a chance of competing against PlayStation from a hardware level, well, those rumours just wouldn't go away. Come November 1994, Sega launched the Saturn in Japan with the product it needed to deliver. A uh, reasonably competent, if rough around the edges, port of Virtua Fighter, but it was the fast, smooth, polished, fully texture mapped Ridge Racer on PlayStation that really caught the attention of the audience. And yet, it was PlayStation that I think provided that first true next generation moment. The marketing campaign was quite different overall as Sony tapped into the more surreal and abstract to catch the eyes and turn heads. Directed primarily by the UK and French branches of Sony, these ads don't have much to do with games as a whole, but it signals a change in tone and culture, exactly how Sony wanted the PlayStation itself to be seen. The console wasn't just promoted in toy stores, but also in places where older teenagers and young adults would be. For example, my first interaction with the PlayStation was not in an electronic store, not in a toy store, not in a music shop. It was in a skateboarding shop. Perhaps most important of all was Sony's ability to leverage music to their advantage, and perhaps in no territory was this felt more than in Europe. The trends were changing, and younger adults that had grown up playing games were now growing towards a more rebellious, more underground sense of style. Much like the way that punk had grown out of the back alley clubs in the 70s, the 90s saw an emergence of techno, trance, and rave music combining that rebellious nature of punk with the consumerism of pop. The best example of this is Prodigy, a band that would really start the fire with this generation and in many ways would go to define the sheer soundscape that so many would associate with the system and eventually even appear in the games themselves. For the system's actual launch, Sony would shuffle things around a bit in terms of lineup, heavily relying on their new internal studio at Cygnosis. Cygnosis not only had a strong pedigree in producing absolutely incredible technical showpieces in gaming, but they also had been able to assist Sony in updating the internal SDK to take full advantage of the hardware much beyond what had been seen months prior for the Japanese launch. Well, outside of Mahjong, Goku Tenjiku that is. But before getting into the actual games of the launch, there's one more piece of software we need to talk about before we get there. The Demo 1. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Now demo discs are nothing new, you can trace them all the way back to the early 80s via magazines, newsletters, and mail-in registration system. However, Demo 1 differed in just the sheer production value and the influence it would come to have on the early life of the PlayStation. Among the playable demos, Battle Arena to Shinden and the first glimpse of the upcoming Destruction Derby really showcased the 3D prowess of the system to be unlike any console before it. And among the many video previews, these were not just mere gameplay footage with a logo slapped on top, but many of them edited very similar to a music video montage, again tapping into the music side that Sony was so accustomed to. Sony actually provided a lot of guidance and assistance in the early promotion materials for publishers, and it really shows when you check out the Demo 1. Though what is perhaps most fondly remembered here is this guy. Yes, the T-Rex. 
this bad boy runs in real time and it was an absolutely phenomenal display of the hardware. This really became the showpiece for the system in regards to its potential. And with the ominous music and the hyper realistic dinosaur model, it really was one of those moments you'll never forget the first time you saw it. You can rotate the camera, you can zoom in and out. You can even open its mouth and overlay Richard Ledbetter's voice and pose to fit in perfectly. Join our supporter program today. It's radical. Of course, we can't forget about the Mata Ray either, which is actually my personal favorite and something I would often put on in the background while I was doing homework. So much so that my dad would buy me a book about the fish for Christmas that year, because he thought I was so in love with them. I actually still haven't told him the truth about all this. So the demo won. I really felt like we had to highlight this thing because of the sheer impact and importance it had on how Sony got the word out about their new home entertainment unit. But I think now it's time to talk about the games. But when you talk about the games in Europe, there is one thing we have to talk about. Yes, that's right, we have to talk about the PAL video standard, the analog TV standard used in Europe and other territories. PAL runs at 50 Hz with 576 displayed lines of resolution, while NTSC is 60 Hz with 480 lines. For low resolution content such as video games in the mid 90s, this becomes 288p for PAL versus 240p for NTSC, basically. Why is this an issue though? Well, a lot of games were obviously developed in Japan and North America, right? Here, we used NTSC with games running at 60 Hz. If you had a title running at, say, 30 or 60 frames per second in NTSC, running at a resolution of 320 by 224, when brought to Europe, this would often run with visible borders along the top and bottom, as they had to fit the lower resolution into the higher resolution PAL output, and the frame rate would be reduced to 25 or 50 frames per second. On the surface, this wouldn't be a big deal, but the problem is game speed was often not adjusted to match. As a result, a drop from 30 to 25 frames per second not only came with decreased fluidity, but the game played slower as well. And in the 16-bit days, sometimes even the music wasn't adjusted. Listen to this. It's extremely evident with launch titles shared between regions such as Ridge Racer and Kilik. The gameplay area is squeezed vertically and the speed of play is reduced. Playing Ridge Racer at 50 Hz feels almost like driving through the mud. It's perfectly playable, but it just feels off. Kilik the Blood and Battle Arena Toshinden are just as bad, each running slower than their NTSC counterpart. These three games, by the way, are shared launch titles between Europe and North America. This is a problem that would plague a wide range of PlayStation games over the life of the system. Few developers took the time to optimize games specifically for 50 Hz. It is worth keeping in mind that doing so was not a trivial task though. And this is where European developers had a chance to really shine, which is what brings us to our first and perhaps most important game of the European PlayStation launch. This is Wipeout, the most popular and successful game to launch alongside the PlayStation in Europe. This stands as the very first entry in a series that would persist up until the PlayStation 4, and remains one of the most beloved games to come out of Sony's European development arm. Wipeout is the creation of Cygnosis, which had just been acquired by Sony before launching the PlayStation. It's a futuristic, zero-gravity racing game, something we had seen before in titles such as F-Zero, but this time it has a twist. Your ship has real inertia and physics, which players must learn to master using a pair of air brakes to tackle wild twists and turns in the track. This is a fast game and the learning curve is steep, but once you get it, it quickly becomes addictive and almost entrancing. A dance with the vicious snake-like track design as you touch the sky before plummeting down the slope all to a stunning soundtrack. 
And that sort of ties into its image. This is a good example of how Sony tapped into the culture of its day. Wipeout channeled the burgeoning European club scene of the mid-90s. It features a superb soundtrack, primarily crafted by Cold Storage, but in its original European incarnation also includes tracks by Orbital, Left Field, and The Chemical Brothers. Wipeout also features graphic design elements by The Designers Republic, a famous British graphic design studio along with Keith Hopwood. This includes the packaging, marketing materials, and in-game logos. It's a key part of its visual identity. Wipeout even made an appearance in the film Hackers from 1995 via a pre-rendered CGI mock-up of what the game might look like. You can even see the ImageSoft logo in there. But obviously, this is a long way from what was possible on the PlayStation. The point is, Wipeout tapped into pop culture in a big way while also offering a superb and unique gameplay experience. And just as important as the gameplay, Wipeout showcased what PlayStation could do in 3D. Cygnosis was known for its technical prowess, and Wipeout showcased this well. There had never been a racing game quite like this. The steep slopes and smooth curves were unlike anything else in the market at the time and it all ran at a stable 30 frames per second. Well, that is, in the NTSC version which would follow. We've already talked about the PAL video format earlier, and Wipeout first launched in PAL territories. While it's limited to 50Hz output, the gameplay speed feels correct, and it does not suffer from issues plaguing Ridge Racer and the like. That is to say, it's properly optimized for PAL. So yeah, the audiovisual experience left a strong impact this was one impressive and well-playing game. It's not perfect though, it did exhibit some limitations. The draw distance was limited, with obvious draw-in without fog, while PlayStation's affine texture swim, which would become very common on the system, was always evident, not to mention geometry seams were present in many tracks. It was very smooth, but it actually felt a little less solid than, say, Crystal Dynamics Crash and Burn on the 3DO. Now keep in mind that that game uses sprites for all of its cars and weapons, while Wipeout is fully polygonal, and it also runs at a much lower frame rate, but it makes for an interesting comparison. Now as a first party published game for PlayStation, you might be surprised to learn that Wipeout was ported to other platforms as well, specifically the PC and Sega Saturn. Yes, Wipeout was released on Sega's machine by SoftBank. So let's start with that version. At a glance, it looks pretty good. Texture warping is actually reduced ever so slightly due to the way the Saturn handles its quads, and it retains the visual signature of Wipeout. But look closer and the flaws begin to appear. This is one of the first games we've examined thus far which highlights weaknesses of the Saturn's ability to handle 3D well. Firstly, the frame rate, it's lower. When comparing NTSC versions of the game, the Saturn version of Wipeout tops out at just 20 frames per second, while PlayStation delivers a stable 30. When the camera collides with the scenery, it also tends to break apart more easily, showing gaps in the track. Beyond this, Saturn lacks alpha blended transparencies, instead relying on a dithered mesh pattern. And lastly, the distant sky is handled using Saturn's VDP2, which means it's a tile map, basically. So it looks slightly cleaner than on PlayStation, actually, but it only scrolls left and right, so it feels kind of less connected to the world. This wouldn't be the last Cygnosis title on Saturn, either. Destruction Derby and 3D Lemmings, among others, were both being ported. None of these ports are a match for the originals on PlayStation, but they're not bad. On PC, though, there's not just one version, there's actually two. Basically, there's this initial MS-DOS release. But there's also an exclusive Windows 95 version designed for the ATI Rage 3D cards. We're going to check out both today. So first there's DOS. Curiously, this one can run straight from the CD, which is somewhat uncommon for PC games I've found. And it compares favorably. It uses DOS Mode X again, so it's a 70Hz game capped at 35 frames per second that runs in 8-bit color. This means it's lacking some of the gradients and smooth transparency of PlayStation, but otherwise it matches up surprisingly well against the console version. Clearly though, the game engine is limited by its original target, as even on PC there's a lot of polygon sorting issues which kind of mar the image quality. You can of course dial down the visual settings though, 
I call this 486 mode. I remember playing it on a 486DX2 66MHz, and by turning down the settings, you could achieve playable frame rates. Obviously, for this video, I'm using a more powerful Pentium 3 system, which outclasses anything that would have been available in 1996. But then there's the ATI-specific version of the game. I ran this on an ATI Rage Pro AGP. It supports resolutions up to 640x480 while offering features such as bilinear texture filtering. The frame rate is still, unfortunately, capped at half the refresh rate, which varies per resolution. It runs well on the Rage Pro, but I'm not a huge fan of the look. Essentially, the high resolution mode highlights the inherent polygon instability issues in this game. The sorting errors become very difficult to ignore at this resolution, and the whole game just looks wobbly and unstable as a result. I do believe this was designed for older ATI Rage cards, and I did run into some graphical issues on the Rage Pro specifically. Which is why I still recommend going with the PlayStation version above all. While its sequels would surpass the original, the original Wipeout was a critical game at launch and one that helped define the PlayStation in Europe. If you wanted to get a little higher though, perhaps, Namco had something else for European players. This is Air Combat, the localized version of Ace Combat as it was released in Japan. It's always interesting to reflect back on the origins of a classic series, and in this case, this is a new game derived from a 1993 arcade title, and it kinda shows. While elements that would come to define the Ace Combat series going forward are present, it feels a little bare bones compared to what would follow. You basically play through a series of missions tackling both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground targets along the way. Complete the mission, then it's back to the menu to do the next one. It's simple and fun, but it's just a taste of where the series would go from this point. It does, however, make for a nice early game release on PlayStation. Visuals are sharp and clean, the frame rate is stable, and the action reasonably fast. Flight games were hugely popular on the PC at the time, and Air Combat demonstrated what's possible on the PlayStation at this time, even if it's not necessarily one of the more impressive launch titles. It is worth noting though that PC games like MechWarrior 2 had released in 1995 and were considered cutting edge. Ace Combat's texture mapping is kind of a step above I'd say, even if I love the aesthetic for MechWarrior 2. The presentation though is still relatively solid at least. Menus are rendered using the PlayStation's interlaced high resolution mode and it runs at a nice frame rate. In game, the resolution is reduced and dithering is apparent when using anything other than composite or RF, but again, it works well enough. I should mention here though that, like Ridge Racer, Air Combat was not properly adapted for PAL televisions, thus it runs slower and with obvious borders, which is of course disappointing, but unfortunately, it would be the norm with Japanese developed PlayStation games. But alas, there isn't much more to say about this one, it's just a good start for what would become a brilliant series. Our next game though, is very much old school in the best possible way. Rapid Reload is yet another launch game courtesy of Media Vision, who you might remember from earlier in the episode providing Japan with the launch game title of Crime Crackers. This time around, Media Vision stays in the more familiar territory of a strictly 2D side-scrolling action game. Now you might notice that the game has a striking similarity to another game, that of Super Mario Bros. But look even closer and you might recognize another game as well. That's right, Rapid Reload takes a healthy dose of inspiration from Treasure's classic Mega Drive romp, Gunstar Heroes. Emulating the 16-bit actioner down to a T. Now the origins of just why this game shares so much in common with Treasure's game has been speculated on over the years, and just taking a cursory Google search showed me everything from fairies to Treasure themselves doing the game, to Media Vision wanting to outdo Treasure at their own game. However, the origins for Rapid Reload seems to be much more interesting than that. Now details are sparse on the subject, but from what I can gather from blurbs in magazines such as Famitsu, Dengeki PlayStation and other places, as well as cache Japanese sites circa 1995, Rapid Reload, or Gunner's Heaven as it's known in Japan, began as a project by Yokiote, 
for the Super Famicom as an attempt to bring Gunstar Heroes like action to the 16-bit platform. Now longtime DF Retro fans might find that name slightly familiar as it is the same developer that made Hook, Sky Blazers and Cooley Skunk, a game that also began its life on the Super Famicom but eventually got released on the PlayStation as Punky Skunk and did get its own episode right here on Digital Foundry. Due to circumstances that is slightly unclear to me, MediaVision seems to have come into the project at some point and helped bring it over to the PlayStation. But when you analyze the color palette, the in-game sprites, the general art direction as a whole, it is clear that the game does seem to have been destined for Nintendo's system at some point. So what about the game then? Well, as mentioned, the game takes a lot of inspiration from Gunstar Heroes, though it isn't quite that simple. The frantic, fast-paced nature of Gunstar Heroes has been slowed down a tad bit and the action focuses a bit more on precision and health conservation in comparison. Think something more akin to Metal Slug and Contra in this regard, and no doubt tied to the fact that it was originally meant for the Super Famicom's slower clock speed. You take on the role as either Alex Sonics or Luca Hetfield of the Commandos at large, Treasure Hunter is seeking the Valkyrie, a treasure that is also sought after by their rivals at the Pumpkin Heads. Apart from the interchangeable weapons such as the homing lasers, flamethrowers, neutral turrets, and the smart bombs, there's also the Gunstar Heroes-esque melee attack in close range, as well as this grappling hook which never seems to come into play in the game for some reason, at least as far as I can find. Now the biggest point of difference in this game from any contemporaries is, well, uh, the points. Blasting your way through enemies, you'll find these diamond points being left behind that you can collect. The more points you gather, the more powered up your weapon gets, and over time, this ticks down like a timer. It's an interesting system for sure. Hidden in the crates and enemies, you also find these booster power-ups which maximizes the strength of your gun for a short period of time. Through the stages, you'll also find these area bosses before you take on the pumpkin heads themselves in the climatic boss battles. Now in terms of content, the game is on the lighter side of things. There are six stages in all, some of them deviating from the run and gun in favor of this side-scrolling shooter style stage. The overall game runs pretty well with massive explosions, plenty of sprites on screen at once, only occasionally dipping below the 60 like here in this flight stage, but generally staying locked and loaded. What's quite disappointing however is the lack of a 2 player mode despite the fact that the game has 2 playable characters. Seems like this would have been an obvious feature to include, but I guess there's a reason for it. Now the more interesting option in the game is this, BGM Type A and Type B. Now I've actually seen mentions online that this is a simple toggle between stereo and mono, however this is incorrect. So what is it then? Well check this out. As you can hear, it does select between two distinctly different soundtracks. So what's going on here then? Why does Rapid Reload have two soundtracks for the same game? Well, I think I have the answer actually. While Type A seems to be making full use of the CD-ROM format, playing digital sound files featuring live instrumentations and such, Type B, however, is what I believe to have been the original compositions meant for the Super Famicom version of the game using the sample-based playback. It wouldn't have sounded this good naturally, but I'm fairly certain this is what at the very least was meant to be the compositions to be arranged for the SBC 700. So what are some of the differences then between the Japanese release and the European release? Well, there's actually a few notable differences on display here. For one, of course, it's the name, which in Japan plays even more into the Gunstar Heroes inspiration. Just take a look at the first initials of this name. But surprisingly, the biggest change in terms of content comes in the form of this voice option here. When turned on, Gunner's Heaven features fully voiced segments prior to the boss battles. Whereas in Rapid Reload, they are text only. Now the translation seems to also have been simplified in localization, and there's parts of the game where it's not even localized, like the credits. Now another tiny difference, in the Japanese version you have infinite continues, whereas in the European version you have a limit of 9 continues. But of course, as I'm sure you're expecting by now, Rapid Reload runs much slower than its Japanese anti-SC counterpart, but what surprised me here is just how much slower it is. 
I actually had a memory of this game being quite fast from my own launch day copy, but upon revisit, it is one of those games that really, really gave the PAL format the bad name. It is baffling how slow this is. This is also one of those games that never saw a release in the United States due to that famed directive to not feature 2D gaming on a new 3D system, which is a shame because I think it actually could have found an audience over there. So that's Rapid Reload. By and large, it is a good 2D action game with some superb art direction and fun fast gameplay. Well, if you have the Japanese version at least. But it is true, Gunstar Heroes it is not. But it is a fun example of how 2D gaming could be done well on the PlayStation, kind of like a Saturn-like experience for the console at this very early stage. Now some of you might have noticed a slight similarity to another Media Vision title, that being Wild Arms, as the art direction was done by Yukihiko Ito. The connections to Wild Arms doesn't stop there, however. If you traverse to the town of Damsen in Wild Arms, you'll find the inn called Gunner's Heaven, run by Axel Sonics. Mm. Gunner's Heaven also shoves up in Wild Arms 3 as an arena, and throughout the series, numerous weapons are named the same in Wild Arms as they show up in the manual for Gunner's Heaven. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty clear that MediaVision never forgot about their little action game here, even though many of us others did. This was actually my favorite of the launch games back then, and I still greatly enjoy today, though I think I'm going to be continuing playing this on the Japanese NTSC version, considering the slowdown. But, I will admit, I do like the name Rapid Reload better than Gunner's Heaven. If you have the chance, do check out Gunner's Heaven or Rapid Reload, whichever version you can get your hands on, as it is one of the finer early 2D games on the system. This is Nova Storm from Psygnosis, and in many ways, this is the shadow of a genre that was soon to collapse, the FMV game. Now, during the early 90s, as the CD-ROM format took off, developers started experimenting with video playback in games, but this came with serious limitations. You could only influence which clips would play next, but ultimately had little control. Developers were keen to make this work though, and a subset of FMV-driven games started finding its way to the market around 93. Games like Sylphide from Game Arts, Rebel Assault from LucasArts, Mega Race from Cryo, and Microcosm from Psygnosis. Each of these games basically combined full motion video based backgrounds with overlaid sprites. So the gameplay layer offers full control, while the FMV defines the path through the environment and worlds you'll visit. They even integrated an invisible collision system allowing you to collide with objects rendered as part of the FMV layer. It's a novel idea, but the resulting games weren't exactly great. They're more playable than the digital picture style of FMV gaming, however. Nova Storm is born directly from this and is basically from what I can tell the follow-up to Microcosm, and it found its way to the PlayStation just in time for the European launch. The idea is just as I described, you pilot a ship, represented as a series of sprites, that you move around the screen while shooting into the image. You engage enemies as sprites, as well as those embedded into the FMV itself. It's extremely basic, and ultimately rather dull by today's standards, but it did highlight one of the key technical improvements PlayStation brought to the table. High quality, full screen video playback. But Nova Storm was not an exclusive, rather it appeared across a wide range of platforms, including Sega CD, 3DO, FM Towns, and MS-DOS. Search for platform differences online though, and most articles simply state the PlayStation version had full screen FMV, but in reality, the differences run much deeper. Now, I was first made aware of this game with the release of the MS-DOS version. For 94, Nova Storm showcased some exceptionally high quality video that, while not full screen, looked great and ran well even on a slow CD-ROM drive. For this video, I tested that MS-DOS version, but also the Sega CD, 3DO, and of course, PlayStation versions. Unfortunately, I didn't have access to the FM Towns version named Scavenger 4, but based on video evidence, it resembles the 3DO version most closely. Now, the core gameplay between these versions is mostly the same. You move the ship around, blasting enemies, but the underlying FMV, the HUD, the weapon effects, and the soundtrack all kind of differ between them. I have a soft spot for the Sega CD version though. The video itself has so few colors as to become nearly incomprehensible, yet this abstract look feels weirdly appealing in this case, and the actual bullet timings of the action are perhaps the most satisfying. It plays better than you'd expect. 
The PC also has its own advantages. While I'm not a fan of the border around the PC's video, I do appreciate how the ship itself moves at a lower frame rate. That sounds crazy, but listen, on the consoles, the player sprite updates at 60 FPS, but this looks weird as it's a mismatch for the CGI backgrounds. By reducing the frame rate of the sprite layer, the two layers sort of blend together a little nicer. The 3DO version though is kind of the odd one as the video is presented in this smallish window with a HUD only along the top and bottom, yet you can still see the edges of the video frame so it feels a little strange. It also goes crazy with the bomb effects which cause the game to slow down to a halt and flash the screen white, plus the second stage has this music that sounds like a dog barking. But here's where things get weird. The PlayStation version is basically a complete re-envisioning of the original Nova Storm concept. It features completely new 3D renders of everything, and that includes new challenges such as environmental hazards to dodge, which by the way, doesn't work very well. It's also the only other version, alongside the PC, to feature this gentleman during the game's introduction. Our forefathers left Earth in search of a new paradise. With them, they took the ecosystem of our world. Truth be told, I prefer the alternate introduction available on other platforms. Thought to be just software error. Evidence now points to something else, something far deadlier. But still, the overall quality of the video assets is improved, and on paper, this sounds like a good idea. Redoing the assets means they're higher quality, and it takes advantage of PlayStation's video playback, allowing full screen videos. But the core gameplay itself is a lot less enjoyable. The main issue is that they've transitioned most enemy ships to scaled sprites that move rapidly around the screen. I found it more difficult to track their bullets and it feels more chaotic and less precise overall. Beyond this, the new sections I mentioned where you need to dodge in-world objects present in the CGI are terrible. You could easily fly left or right of these bursts of lava for instance, but whether you pass it or not depends upon where the pre-rendered camera decides to go. When you collide with it, you just get this annoying sound effect and lose life. Honestly though, all versions are rather dated by today's standards. FMV sequences such as this are ultimately nothing more than a crutch to deliver better visuals than would otherwise have been possible at the time, at the expense of everything else. While full motion video would occasionally work out in certain genres, it's just not a good fit for action games. Of the titles that employ this method, Sylph Heat is probably the best of the bunch as its FMV sequences are designed to match the in-game sprites, plus the core gameplay itself is simply more enjoyable. So how about the PAL situation then? Well this one's interesting. This is a UK developed game, but it does actually seem to run slower with visible borders along the top and bottom. But here's the thing, in this case, the slight drop in game speed actually improves the gameplay experience. It feels a little too fast in the NTSC version, so I actually prefer the PAL version in this case. Still, of all launch games released for the PlayStation, Nova Storm perhaps feels the most dated. But if you're looking for something a little more fun... I think it's safe to say that in the early stages of 3D gaming, no other genre had a tougher transition to the third dimension than the platformer games. Now there are early examples and attempts to make it work of course, such as Bug and Alpha Waves, and while there seemed to be hope on the horizon with the eventual Bubsy 3D and Super Mario 64, in 1995 the genre was still having trouble making the jump. In 1994, Japanese independent developer Xact focused their efforts on creating a full 3D action game for the Sharp X68 development environment system that sought to bring the polygonal action of Star Fox together with a more grounded tank-like movement. The result was one of the most technically impressive games for the X68 as a whole, with the game running incredibly well on only 10 MHz clock speed and incredible music that could be coupled with the Roland Sound Campus. The success of this game critically opened the eyes at Sony's upper management, who were eagerly seeking new talent to their roster to compete with the Nintendo and Sega juggernauts. 
and the discussion began to find out exactly how versatile Exact and their 3D engine was when combined with the power of the new PlayStation. Exact developed a proof of concept called Springman, which impressed Sony so much they decided to strap the rocket to the little developer and team them up with another developer, in Ultra, as the feeling was that while Exact had the technical prowess to create an accelerating 3D action game, they lacked the inspiration to design a world and a character which people could connect with. Gone was the militaristic future setting of Geograph Seal, and in its place something much more bright and colorful entered the center stage. This is Jumping Flash. Controlling Robot, players take on 18 stages throughout six worlds of vertical platforming from the first-person perspective, fighting the evil Baron Aloha, who according to the intro at least is an evil scientist who frightens children and is bent on slavery, which is coincidentally Rich's Tinder profile as well. The core mechanic of the game is the double jump, much like the one seen in Geograph Seal, though now greatly enhanced to take the power of the PlayStation into account. This unique aspect allows you to gain the high ground and view the stage from above as Robert tilts his head down and gives you a clear view of what's beneath. With the increased performance and surprisingly decent view distance, this is really made for a fun time circa 1995, and the clever use of your shadow as a guiding tool makes this a relative breeze. The stages are built like small playgrounds, sandboxes of various shapes and objects that Robbie can for the most part jump on to find the jet pods before jumping onto the exit. Throughout the stages you can also find these bonus zones, power-ups such as cherry bombs, missiles, twisters and health increases. When on the ground, Robbie can make use of his blaster, as well as look up and down with the use of the shoulder buttons giving you the option to either use the jump mechanic or your blaster to your advantage depending on the enemy. The stage layouts generally follow the same structure throughout the six worlds, three stages each. The first world will see you hunting jet pogs vertically, while the second stage can be sometimes this kind of dungeon crawler affair, becoming essentially a first person shooter, while the third stage will always house a boss battle. Each world has its own specific theme, and the variety in design and stage layout is quite welcome. The music is quite excellent as well, except for this weird bagpipe song and stage one. I'm not really sure what they were thinking there. So while this all sounds good so far, how does it actually hold up on performance? Well, that's where things get a bit interesting. The game doesn't run on a locked frame rate. actually quite the opposite, the game tries to reach 60 but constantly dips into the 30s and even at certain times dips below this well into the 10s. This can be quite distracting when you quite literally are jumping between a platform at a higher 50 then land on the lower 20s, especially when your friend's name is John Lindman. Orienting yourself on screen can be quite tough at times as well due to the narrow view window and the early 3D controls that aren't always as responsive as you'd like. The on-screen HUD though is pretty clean with your little helper robot here, your health bar, the usual stuff. The stages as well lack a bit of inspiration halfway through the game. It's not that they're badly designed or even repeat too much in terms of complexity, that's all here but it always feels like the game is missing some sort of imaginary next step, a variation of the objective, or just something to break up this monotony. The actual graphics and design on display though are rather excellent, with Robin himself being quite well designed and likable, the simple flat shaded enemy characters having a bit of that rare style appeal with their buggy eyes and cute design. The game just oozes charm and effort and holds up pretty well in this regard, but when revisiting it in today's eyes, it feels like it just needed a tad bit more polish to reach its own potential. Speaking of potential, you might be wondering why Jumping Flash isn't more part of the Sony legacy today than he is, considering the game was a great success at launch, and a prime candidate for what was the coveted mascot role for the company. This is actually quite a good question, I don't really know why, though I would assume it might perhaps have something to do with a certain Kenji Ino signaling the end of his Sony deal by jumping on top of a robot shaped plushie in front of key Sony personnel, before announcing he's going to the Sega Saturn. Yeah, we gotta do an episode of Kenji Ino, I think, another day. So that's Jumping Flash, with its origins on the Japanese home computers and its eventual rise as a launch game smash hit by late 1995, Jumping Flash does remain fun, charming, and interesting in terms of the early adoption of 3D for platformers. Two sequels were produced, Jumping Flash and Robi Mon Dieu, both on the PlayStation and the latter being a Japanese exclusive. 
It is a bit of a shame we never saw a Robit on the PlayStation 2, and he can certainly benefit from some sort of digital revival in these nostalgia heavy days, but until that day comes, this is where the book closes on the Jumping Flash story. And here we are, our final game for the European PlayStation launch. Even though if we had adopted a more traditional ordering system, it may have been discussed first. The reason it's dead last though is because it's not very good. Yes, this is 3D Lemmings. Okay, let me attempt to explain first. Rewind back to well before the launch of PlayStation. You remember Lemmings, right? Sure you do. Created by Scottish developer DMA Design back in 1987, Lemmings quickly became a smash hit arriving on every platform under the sun. This addictive puzzler received numerous installments, and most of them were awesome. After Cygnosis was acquired by Sony, however, DMA Design sought another partnership and kinda went off to do its own thing. You may have heard of it. Cygnosis, however, kept the Lemmings license and tasked Clockwork Games, developers of the seminal Wiz and Liz for the Mega Drive, with creating a new Lemmings game. The intro movie says everything you need to know about the state of the industry in 1995. A desktop computer rendered in glorious CGI depicts these small rascals breaking free of their, uh, prison and becoming 3D with the push of a button. If only it were that easy. Honestly though, the concept is sound and it makes a lot of sense for the time frame. Take the Lemmings puzzle game concept and make the stages 3D. This would allow things like, say, the blockers to now direct lemmings in or out of the screen, while pathways can be used to create some truly wild designs. Problem is, this is the early days of 3D, and the controls show their age. The simple act of moving the camera around in a 3D space while focusing on a central object was new, and using multi-layered buttons on the gamepad, they kind of attempt to make it work. The problem is, it's extremely difficult to make out everything while navigating these spaces. It never feels intuitive. You have various pre-assigned camera angles, but nothing ever quite feels right. Plus, the resolution of the game is at odds with the need to view these stages from a distance. It's difficult to make the lemmings out when they're just two pixels high. It does have this rather fascinating virtual lemming option, of course, which is neat. You basically have an opportunity to experience life from the lemming's perspective. But fundamentally, this game is not fun to play. I see the appeal here, though. It's just that game design in 3D simply hadn't progressed far enough to make something like this work. If you had mastered the controls, perhaps you could have some fun with it, but it's something I was never able to find. But like other Cygnosis games of this era, 3D Lemmings would receive multiple ports. And once again, we have both PC and Sega Saturn as target platforms. Unfortunately, I could not get the Saturn version to actually run on my Saturn. It just crashed. Maybe it's trying to tell me something, but from what I remember playing of it, it runs worse than the PlayStation version. But it's the PC version that is perhaps most fascinating because it manages to partially solve some of the game's issues. It feels like a proper PC game and it's the closest 3D Lemmings comes to becoming an actual good game. Firstly, you have a mouse now. All versions rely on a cursor for selecting options, just like Lemmings always has, but doing so with a D-pad while also managing the camera is extremely tedious. On PC, you can now manipulate the camera with one hand and the mouse cursor with another. Clicking on individual lemmings is a snap on PC. It's a lot more like the classic games. It also has these high resolution intermission scenes and in some ways it looks slightly better, though different is perhaps a better way to describe it. Plus, while I'm running this on a faster Pentium 3 system, it runs better too. Perhaps a little bit too fast, but in this case, the increased speed is actually beneficial as it makes the stages less tedious. Unfortunately, overall, I just don't like this game specifically on consoles, but I understand what they were going for and can respect the efforts behind it. While the PC version is reasonably decent, there's a reason future Lemmings titles would return to two dimensions. This is where they belong, inside this trash can from the intro movie. And with this, PlayStation had officially launched in each of its primary territories. 
From this humble selection of games, the PlayStation library would grow by leaps and bounds over the following years. Many games mentioned today would go on to receive sequels in time, while powerhouse franchises were formed or reborn on the PlayStation. In many ways, gaming as we know today was born from this era, but at the same time, much of what makes the PlayStation so special has seemingly been forgotten as well. This experimental time, a time when anything was possible, truly helped change the gaming landscape forever. And there you have it, the complete retrospective on the origins of the Sony PlayStation. What started as a partnership between Nintendo and Sony ended up changing the video game industry. Sega Saturn would unfortunately fail to catch on in the West, but it did find success in Japan where it lived a long life outperforming Nintendo's own next generation console. Indeed, in 1996, Nintendo finally unleashed its Ultra 64 project, now known as Nintendo 64. Alongside Super Mario 64, it was a revelation, but missteps ensured that it never found the same success as its predecessor. The PlayStation, in comparison, went on to sell more than 100 million units while amassing nearly 8,000 games, securing its place as one of the most successful consoles of all time. And to think, it all started with those eight games back in 1994. Whoa, 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 wait up. Didn't I cover the North American launch games for the PlayStation recently on my show, GameSack? Are you moving in on my territory? Is that what's going on? Once a YouTuber does something and then another YouTuber does something even vaguely similar, that's copying. Them's the rules according to the comment section. Get your own ideas, Digital Foundry. People are already telling me that I copied my idea from Classic Gaming Quarterly which I did, but it's okay when I do it. It's definitely not okay when you do it because you have hundreds of subscribers more. Down with DF Retro, down with Digital Foundry, all 14 of you or however many there are, I really can't keep track, but you know what this means, right? That's right, YouTube War. The PlayStation launch games are mine to control and manipulate, not, shut up! You have not seen the last of me, Digital Foundry. Yeah. God, that stinks.